Members of Council, if I can please have you take your seats. Members of Council. Can you stop the bells? The bells. I would call this meeting to order. Would you please stand for the national anthem? Please remain standing for a moment of silence and during this time remember Pudnit, Alexander, Mary Elizabeth Ann, Betty Fevro, and Robert Bob Williams. Thank you. <coughs> we acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territory of the Mississauga's New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, Wendat, and home to many diverse indigenous peoples. For the benefit of those who are connected to the internet, the city clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. Um, members, before we begin, I would like to welcome Councillor Lucy Troisi to her first council meeting. <laughs> members, we have two presentations this morning. The first is to recognize the Milan Urban Food Policy Award, and I would like to call upon Councillor Joe Mihavik, Chair of the Board of Health, to come forward for the presentation. Good morning, everyone. In uh, 2015, the City of Toronto joined 148 cities across the world to sign the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. The International Pact recognizes that cities, which host over half the world's population, have a strategic role to play in the development of sustainable food systems and in promoting healthy diets. Through the pact, cities like Toronto are pledging to work on developing food systems that provide healthy and affordable food to all peoples in a human rights framework while minimizing waste, conserving biodiversity and mitigating the impacts of climate change. One important aspect of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact is to foster the exchange of food-related solutions and innovation among cities. A mechanism for facilitating this change is through these awards, the Milan Pact Awards, held for the past uh, uh, two years by the City of Milan. This year, Toronto won that award. Toronto Public Health's initiative, Community Food Works for Newcomer Settlement, won the highest score award based on adaptability, integration, innovation, impact, and inclusion. And it's a very prestigious uh, international award. 
Uh, Community Food Works, which is the award that uh, won, won it for us, is a program that integrates food handler training and certification, nutrition education, and employment support through an adult education approach for uh, newcomers. It is, it is offered to residents hoping to work in the food sector or to start their own food businesses. Participants are Toronto residents living on a low income. When Toronto welcomed Syrian refugees to this city, Community Food Works was adapted to meet the needs of this new newcomer community. This included tailoring and translating the curriculum and the introduction of a peer-to-peer -peer model of program implementation and interpretation. The program recognizes the importance of food as a vehicle for settlement and integration into the local community. It does so through emphasizing employability, fostering social cohesion, and helping to break down language and culture barriers. Early pilot results showed that of the 52 initial participants, 90% acquired food handling certification and a quarter of them found employment within three months. Community Food Works for Newcomer Settlement could not happen without proper uh, support and collaboration uh, among a variety of colleagues, both within City Hall, TESS, that, and I think some folks are here from TESS, Toronto uh, Employment Social Services, and SDFA as well, Social Development Finance and Administration, and community partners, and the community partners were working, Women Community Centre, and the Executive Director is here, um, uh, Marcia. Uh, Flemington Health Centre and North York Harvest Food Bank. Together, we are showing how integrating food literacy with food safety while addressing employment as a determinant of health can support the newcomer settlement uh, journey. And so I will show you the award here. And my suggestion is, is that we, well, we offer a big congratulations to the staff that are here and the people who are supportive of this program. Um, maybe I'll give this to the mayor, just to give it, to, it'll eventually get to the staff, but I think for the photo op, the, uh, maybe to the mayor. So let's give them a round of applause, the folks that are here. Thank you, Councillor Mahevic, and congratulations. Um, we do have a second presentation, but it's, we'll have to wait a few minutes uh, for that second uh, presentation. I will now call for a motion to confirm the minutes. Councillor Cole, you have a motion on the minutes from the last two meetings. Um, maybe Councillor Burnside, you could take it. Is it on Councillor Cole's desk? No, I know, but you have, can, can somebody else move it? Okay. Councillor Burnside. Yep, that uh, City Council confirmed the minutes of council from the regular meeting held on October 2, 3, 4, 2017, and the special meeting held on November 2, 2017, in the form supplied to the members. Okay, thank you. All in favor? Carrie. You know, you so well. Take Members of Council, we have the following administrative really inquiry easy. from Councillor right. James Pasternak before us today. Administrative inquiry 34.1 on hate-sponsored rallies, such as Al Quds Day. The inquiry was previously deferred at the October meeting to provide time for the staff to respond. The Deputy City Manager's answer to this inquiry was distributed to members yesterday. May I have a motion to receive the inquiry and answer for information? Moved by Councillor Algemeri. All in favor? Thank you. Our next presentation is to recognize Setsuko Thurlow on accepting the Nobel, Nobel P, uh, Peace Prize on behalf of the International Cam Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. I would like to call upon Mayor Tory to come forward for this presentation. Well, Madam Speaker, thank you. 
<coughs> pardon me, uh, last week uh, we were privileged to have here in Toronto the recipient of the 2016 uh, Nobel Peace Prize who uh, is the President of Columbia. And uh, it is even more gratifying, that was very gratifying to have him here and to have a chance to recognize what he had done in the cause of peace. Uh, but today to have one of our own, uh, Setsuko Thurlow, uh, here with us today, uh, she will be accepting soon a Nobel Peace Prize together with Beatrice Finn, the Executive Director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, otherwise known as ICANN. ICANN is being recognized for its work in raising awareness of the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and for its groundbreaking efforts to achieve a treaty-based prohibition of such weapons. Setsuko Thurlow is a survivor herself of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings during the Second World War. Her family was living there when nuclear weapons were deployed uh, on Japan, uh, killing thousands of innocent people she, at the time, was 13 years old. ICANN credits Sasuko, Setsuko for being a driving force in the fight to abolish nuclear weapons since the launch of ICANN some 10 years ago. ICANN also noted that Setsuko has campaigned against nuclear weapons all of her life, continues to campaign with many other members, and plays a pivotal role in efforts at the United Nations to adopt a landmark treaty banning nuclear weapons. Satsuko, I cannot imagine the pain and the suffering that you have endured throughout your life as a result of those experiences so many years ago. But it is because of you and other survivors, otherwise known as the Hibakusha, who raise awareness about the horrific consequences of nuclear weapons. As you know, but for others who don't know, Hibashuka is the Japanese word for the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings. Acknowledgement also needs to be given to all of the campaign supporters around the globe who work tirelessly to fight for this cause. We cannot erase history and tragedies like the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, and they will never be forgotten. However, we can uh, join forces around the world to ensure that this never happens again. Setsuko Thurlow and Beatrice Finn will accept the Nobel Peace Prize in Norway on December the 10th. Satsuko, as you are deeply humbled to be receiving this prestigious award on behalf of ICANN, I know that that is true. Next month in Oslo at their city hall, we too are honored and privileged to recognize you for this achievement right here at Toronto City Hall in the city that you call home. We are so very pleased that since the 1950s you have called Toronto home. The City of Toronto continues to value the contributions and the profound impacts made by citizens like you. It is truly the diversity among our people that strengthens our great city. And it is our wish that with the love and the support from your family and from your friends and from ICANN, supporters uh, uh, who, who are here and around the world, that this admirable recognition, this global recognition, brings you a degree of peace and comfort and hope. Please join me, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming Setsuko Thurlow to the podium so that I can present her with something that seems wholly inadequate in the context of, uh, of this great recognition she's received globally, but which is a scroll that comes with the heartfelt thanks and appreciation and respect and gratitude of the people of, of the City of Toronto as we say to you, thank you for your humanitarian efforts and your quest for a nuclear-free world so that we can continue, all of us, here in Toronto and elsewhere around the world to live in safety and harmony. Please come forward. I was just <clears throat> I was just invited to say a few words. I'm not here prepared with a speech. I just want to say thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for the recognition all of you are giving 
the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapon. This organization consisting of the young and old, millions of people from around the world worked together very, very hard the past 10 years or so. It's amazing what this group has accomplished within 10 years. And now, Nobel Peace Prize is recogn recognizing the accomplishment of this work. But this accomplishment is just the beginning of our struggle. It's just the prohibition of nuclear weapon. We want elimination of all the nuclear weapon. It <laughs> so that means we have to continue to work toward that goal and don't just leave it to this organization and many other organizations. Each one of us, you and I, together, have to keep working to achieve that goal. Thank you again, all the counselors, mayor, for this recognition. It's the question of life and death. It's a massive death we are potentially confronting. We must work together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Ajumeri. Uh, my, my colleague, Councillor Pasternak, was not in the room uh, when we dealt with an item very close to his heart. And I think that we just, we, we didn't know. I'm sorry. So I'd like to move reconsideration of that item and uh, give him the opportunity to make his motion. Okay, thank you. So with your Councillor indulgence. No. Councillor Ajumeri is moving that we reconsider. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. I'd like to refer this to Executive Committee. Okay, Councillor Pasternak is moving that we refer to the Executive Committee. All in favor? Carried. Administrative inquiry. Okay, so now it's referred. I will now call upon the committee chairs to introduce their reports. The chairs can speak about the reports for up to five minutes. Mayor Tory, you have a motion to introduce the executive committee report. I do, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The, I move that the report from meeting 28 of the executive committee listed on the agenda of council be presented uh, for consideration. Uh, as always, we had a wide variety of items that were before us, and uh, a number of members of council came to uh, uh, participate in those discussions with us, and I'll just mention a couple of the items. Uh, one that is moving forward and I think has a lot of work yet to be done, of course, the proof of the pudding being in the implementation, is the, uh, the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Master Plan. But I think to have such a plan uh, presented to us, and it was approved by the Executive Committee, um, is a significant step forward. Uh, the facilities master plan is informed, of course, by our growing and changing uh, population and the ongoing high demand for parks and recreation programs and services across the city. And the plan commits, uh, as it should, to building new facilities and renewing current assets to meet demand, uh, while at the same time finding new and creative ways to deliver services in partnership with everybody, <laughs> including other divisions of the city, institutions, developers, and others. And I think this is going to be very important uh, to what I believe will be a more equitable and, and a sensible distribution of facilities across the city uh, and to prioritize investment in these important assets over the next 20 years. Uh, we also dealt, Madam Speaker, with the uh, transformation uh, task force uh, report coming from the Toronto Police Service. As you know, uh, the Police Services Board uh, formed the transformational task force with the mandate to determine how better uh, to deliver uh, policing services more effectively and more efficiently at the same time. 
Uh, and to date, uh, the city's review has identified three of the task force's recommendations uh, that will have an impact on city divisions. Uh, and those are the Beach Lifeguard Program to be delivered going forward by the city's Parks, Forestry and Recreation Division beginning November 10, 2017. The School Crossing Guard Program uh, to be delivered by a third-party service provider under contract with the city's Transportation Services Division beginning August 1, 2019. And there was also recommended that the city, uh, together with the Toronto Police Service, should develop a risk assessment tool to identify non-emergency calls that can be uh, redirected, as it were, or addressed through alternative approaches, including redirection to the appropriate city uh, agency or division. But the primary goal of, of these changes is to have these particular responsibilities, I think quite properly, addressed by civilian people working under the direction of the city government so that we can reduce some of the pressure that has existed in prior years as we ask highly trained, expensive uh, police officers to take on more and more things that probably uh, now upon examination were not uh, best in the domain of the police service. And so uh, there are going to be some upfront uh, costs associated with building this capacity within the city government, uh, but I know that we can take that on. I know ultimately that is going to produce long-term benefits for the city and for the people of the city, both in terms of effective service delivery, but also cost-effective uh, service delivery, both in the context of the city itself uh, and uh, the police budget. Finally, Madam Speaker, and I've designated it as one of my, in fact, the first of my priority items uh, for this meeting, we dealt with a report that advances a fair integration between the TTC and the GO network. And when I say advances it, it really advances it from a standing position of zero uh, to a solid first step forward, but only a first step forward. And I've been very careful and consistent, I hope, in my uh, public remarks on your behalf to say this is a step forward, but just a step forward in the ultimate cause of achieving uh, fair integration across the region. This particular report recommends that you approve a, uh, an agreement between the TTC, uh, the city, and Metrolinx, which will discount the cost of transfers uh, between the TTC and GO Transit Up Express by $1.50 per adult and $0.55 cents per senior or student youth uh, uh, passenger. By the time the agreement is fully implemented, the cost of the discount to the province, and the implementation, by the way, will take place very early next year, uh, will be $18.4 million annually. And so I want to say, um, in an appropriately cautious way, thank you to the Government of Ontario for the fact that they've stepped up and taken this first step. I say cautious only because there's much more work to be done on the real goal of achieving a fair integration, and a fair integration that is fair. Uh, to the people of the City of Toronto as residents of this region, both in terms of their own uh, status as residents of this city, but also in their, uh, relative to other people who live uh, in this region. We now have the basis to work uh, on uh, further progress on fair integration going forward, whereas before uh, we didn't even have that foundation. I believe, as I think members of this Council do, that integrated fares are essential to create a true regional transit network uh, one that maximizes the benefits for everybody, but in particular our responsibility is to the people of the City of Toronto, uh, maximizes the benefits of GO, Regional Express Rail, Smart Track, and all forms of transit uh, for the benefit of Torontonians. Uh, I look forward to discussing these matters, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday, you have a motion to introduce the Audit Committee report. I do. Thank you, Madam Speaker, that the report from meeting 10 of the Audit Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. I'll also take a quick moment to thank the Auditor General, her team, and the management of the City in an exciting meeting of 20 items. Um, I will also take a moment as well to congratulate uh, Councillor Carmichael Greb as being elected the Vice Chair of the Audit Committee and thanking uh, Councillor Chin Lee for his service as Vice Chair over the last year and of course the prior two years as chair of the audit committee. Um, I will highlight a couple of the items that were discussed at audit. Um, AU 10.2, 10.3 and 10.4 all relate to our municipal licensing and standards division and that was a review of um, how inspections and complaints are handled. And it dove deeper into the additional audits to focus in on licensed holistic centers and uh, eating establishments and nightclubs. Those two subsequent reports uh, generated some questions in audit um, 
And they really uh, pointed out to some of the difficulty in enforcing business licenses in these two categories. There was also an audit on the Toronto Building Division conditional permits. And what that audit signaled to us is the future of having a, a consistent set of criteria to recognize the need for a conditional permit in a consistent way about communicating changes in development charges that were coming up. We looked at the 2018 audit plan. We also looked at obtaining best value through vendor rosters and our vendor roster system. We looked at improving the effectiveness of basement flooding uh, protection subsidy program. And I will note to members that that is very distinct from the overall basement flooding protection program, which involves the work. The auditor lo did look at the program where we provide the subsidies or the, uh, the grants to homeowners for installing such things as sump pumps and backwater valves and what the future may hold for that program. Um, the auditor looked at a, um, um, some, uh, some work on the single stream recyclable material program and of course the auditor focused in on a review of a complaint regarding a Toronto Transit Commission briefing note and I will take a moment to remind members that this particular audit was created uh, and, and carried through because of an allegation that was made from a member of a citizen group that staff within the Toronto Public Service had provided misleading information to council because of political pressure. The auditor examined the circumstances around this briefing note and ultimately she determined that uh, there was some changes required on how information such as briefing notes should be distributed to councillors um, in advance of a meeting in a consistent manner. And the auditor was very uh, careful to point out that her role was not to audit the Scarborough subway or open that debate, but to look at the circumstances around that briefing note. And I think you'll find her report speaks to that in a very specific manner. Uh, we heard several uh, audit items on outstanding audits, and I would encourage you to look at those, and in particular, the, interest I the divisions that you have an interest in. We looked at several financial statements, including business improvement areas and some of our agencies and corporations. And finally, there was an audit of the Toronto Transit Commission accounts payable functions, which is a, a large uh, volume of dollars, and the auditor found some areas uh, where she some suggested some improvements. Um, I would just like to point out to members that some of these audits are very, very uh, lengthy and technical in nature and I'd like to offer both myself and on behalf of members of the audit committee and the auditor if you have any questions in advance of hearing these items I would look forward to helping facilitate getting answers to you in an efficient manner um, so that we can use council's time very wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mahavik, you have a motion to introduce the Board of Health report. Yes, thank you very much uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, that the report of meeting 22 of the Board of Health listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. There's only one item uh, that I think I should draw uh, to uh, folks' attention, and it is the only item on uh, Council's agenda from the Board of Health. And it re it's uh, about a, a panel that the province convened to look at public health and, to, uh, and the, the problem with the report and why it is really, really important. It's going to change the very heart and soul of what public health does or the way public health is structured in the governmental systems that we have now in place. So they're working, the province is working out the powers and the areas of responsibility for the lenses and they've asked a panel to comment on well where does public health fit into that. Well right now we have a public health system that is well integrated into the municipal uh, system. And that municipal system has produced a lot of public good. If you talk to a public health epidemiologists and people who work on population health, they will note that the big advances in life expectancy and quality of life for folks happens because of things like built form, things like um, uh, making sure that uh, we all had indoor plumbing in the 1920s. That didn't come from the works department. That directive actually came from the public health department uh, uh, almost a century ago. Uh, we know in, since amalgamation that public health has been very active on things that are directly related to health but, not, but are not primary health. 
The province's panel is suggesting that it be pulled somewhat out of the municipal system and put into the LIN system. And that is a big threat to how public health operates and the ability of public health to do healthy public policy, uh, which is really what we are about here at the city. If you look at the things we've been working on, SARS, the contribution that, uh, that, the, uh, rest, that the public health has met, made to people's health in terms of uh, eating, the restaurant grading system, smoking in restaurants, active living, uh, the fair wage that is coming forward uh, later on in the budget process uh, with the TTC, the anti-poverty initiatives, food security issues. Those are issues that have been won partly because public health added its voice. To tear it out of that system and put it in the LINs and provincial health care system is bad, bad structure. It's not a very helpful structure. Where they have done that elsewhere, they have found that public health has very quickly actually diminished its role because, you know, a doctor in an emergency situation will always win over a public health doctor who is, who is looking at things more longitudinally and across on a population health uh, basis. So it's something that I think uh, uh, it's very interesting. AMO has written a very, very strong position paper to the province saying that they should not go in this direction. Every single Board of Health across the province that has commented on it has said this is something to be rejected. Uh, and also the uh, Association of Local Health Authorities in, Toronto, in Ontario have said that this is not something to be supported. And today we're being invited to add our voice to that, uh, that chorus. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm not holding it, but I just thought I should alert you and speak now rather than later. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak, you have a motion to introduce the Community Development and Recreation Committee report. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting 23 of the Community Development and Recreation Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. I would simply bring to your uh, attention the issues of child care, the Tenant Defence Fund, and managing refugee flows. And if you connect the dots and look very closely at these issues, you can see that most of them are not in municipal jurisdiction but have become over time or are becoming increasingly municipal jurisdiction. Surely the continuum of care and education is, under the, uh, is carried primarily under the Education Act, which clearly is provincial jurisdiction. The Tenant Defense uh, Fund is uh, under the Regis Residential Tenancies Act, which is clearly provincial jurisdiction, but we're more involved. And of course, managing refugee flows, which is a, a major uh, emerging issue that's in growing increasingly expensive. The report before you asked for another $20 million to handle uh, in our shelter system the growing uh, surge of refugees. While we welcome all these policy initiatives from our other uh, counterparts at both the provincial and federal level, the sustainability and quality of them, even if existing transfers are up to a level that can handle these programs, the long-term ability of the city to manage more and more public policy issues that are coming from the other levels of government is clearly uh, in question. How big a government do we really need here? How big a government will it take to make sure these programs are managed and implemented properly? And can we rely on future governments that change either in Ottawa or Queen's Park to make sure that the transfers to sustain these programs are done at a level that's acceptable? You'll also notice a motion that was passed at CDR, which, which I supported, uh, working or hypothetically working towards a $10 per day uh, uh, daycare uh, cost. Uh, this was taken primarily from the Quebec model. Uh, I think it's um, an unrealistic uh, goal and may give false, uh, false hope and false promises uh, to many across uh, our, our great city. The Quebec situation is quite different than uh, Toronto and Ontario. The uh, low cost of, uh, of uh, daycare there was uh, backstop by massive tax increases, both indirect taxation and income tax uh, increases, and it was came to power came came to fruition as a public policy from from nationalist uh, movement. So those are those are issues to consider uh, as we go forward, and I, I look forward to discussions. Thank you, Councillor. 
Bragadakis, you have a motion to introduce the Economic Development Committee report. I sure do. Um, that the report from meeting 24 of the Economic Development Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Um, we have like three items uh, that came forward uh, to Council from this last meeting of Economic Development, uh, but the one that I'm going to highlight is probably the most important one as, as far as I'm concerned is um, in regards to the economic and social impacts of an accessible, high-quality childcare system in Toronto, and we had asked staff to assess um, those impacts on a more affordable uh, childcare um, for Toronto's economy. And, and much has been written and much has been said about the positive short-term and long-term uh, socioeconomic impacts of investing in a high-quality, accessible childcare system. Um, and this council has actually adopted a 10-year licensed childcare growth system that Toronto families need. And, um, I think we all know that the plan requires significant investments from all three orders of government, um, but these investments, I, I believe, um, and I think others believe, that uh, they make sense for Toronto's kids and they make sense for Toronto's families, but uh, also they make sense for the local economy. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Palazzo, you have a motion to introduce the Licensing and Standards Committee report. Yes, I do, Madam Speaker. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I would like to move that the report from meeting 22 of the Licensing Standards Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor McMahon, you have a motion to introduce the Parks and Environment Committee report. Yes, I do. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting 22 of the Parks and Environment Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shiner, you have a motion to introduce the Planning and Growth Management Committee report. I most certainly do, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting 23 of the Planning and Growth Management Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. As my colleagues know, I have a monthly comment or report on the number of affordable housing units, and my colleague, Councillor Cressy, has asked me, and he was right to point out one in his area that we didn't originally include in our list. So we did, in approving today, 3,085 affordable housing units. There's only, sorry, 3,085 units of new housing. There's only 44 affordable housing units. So I bring it up because we're always talking about trying to meet 10% on every development, but we're meeting 1% in the approvals that we actually have going forward. And somehow, through all the work that we do, I think we've got to still try to address that better to get more units in front of us because I think we can do better than that. On the agenda itself, um, there's a few items of interest. Those of you that are here and in the public that have always had frustration with the province and the Ontario Municipal Board know that changes are coming. Hopefully. Changes are coming. I am believing that changes are coming and it's long about time. So a number of the amendments were and considerations were at the committee and one of the most important ones there along with others is the, the fact that there won't be any de novo hearings and it always confused me. What does de novo mean? Well it really means whatever you've done doesn't matter. It starts again and every development can start afresh with a whole new application and a whole new design by whoever's there. So that is one of the very positive aspects that's going forward. In other words, what the application is, is what you can consider. There are quite a number of other changes, but I will also tell you that with all of that responsibility coming to us in council and councils across the province, we're going to have to work harder to make sure that each of our colleagues, when they're reviewing a development, an application is one that we understand when it comes here and it's fair and reasonable because more of that responsibility will be resting with us. The Toronto Green Standards, great, it's a change. It's trying to get us to achieve near zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 on new buildings. It's a wonderful thing because we're staying, changing our standards. It's something we have to encourage people to continue to go along with so we can continue to be leaders in that field. So those are the issues that are there. There was one other item that isn't here. I'm sure you'll probably hear about it after, which is the Portland framework. So we did not accomplish making responsibilities, making recommendations to you, but we hope to at our next meeting. 
Thank you. Councillor Robinson, you have a motion to introduce the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do indeed, and it is that the report from meeting 24 of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. And first of all, I'd like to recognize and congratulate our staff in solid waste management because they actually won two great awards from the North American Excellent Award Association. Uh, the first award they, award they won was a gold one, and it was for, uh, it's, it was related to the management systems category and for long, our long-term waste management strategy, which we approved as a council months back. Uh, this is an important roadmap, and it was clearly um, thought of as an excellent roadmap by this association. The second award we won was a bronze award in the landfill management category for Green, land, Green Lane Landfill the city's state-of-the-art facility that uses innovative technologies to provide safe, effective and environmentally sustainable disposable of Toronto's res residual waste. So these are great awards. Uh, we've been recognized across our nation. Uh, so uh, my congratulations and all of Council's congratulations to the Solid Waste Management Services for these amazing honours. Uh, Public Works was a very long meeting in October, very productive. We talked about on-street electrical vehicle charging station pilot, and uh, the working group will continue to address the availability of charging stations, the impact on our, our grid, and the development of electric vehicle friendly policies. Um, certainly, I think most of us agree that we need to be leaders on this, uh, on this issue, getting this infrastructure in place. And this one-year evalu evaluation pilot will actually give us an opportunity to figure out how to best encourage electric vehicles in Toronto. We also talked about improving accountability in the utility cut process. I know a lot of my residents have uh, emailed me about this over the years and making sure that we have better uh, restoration processes in place. So, hallelujah, the report is here. We're moving forward with a, a long-awaited update on this. Improvements to the utility cut process will allow for permanent pavement treatments immediately rather than waiting for a freeze cycle, a thaw cycle. Um, so rather than disrupting our poor residents with this temporary and then permanent repair, we'll be going right to the permanent. Uh, because the temporary has actually been very challenging to, to traverse as well as aesthetically unpleasing. So um, this is great news for the city and this report is before us. They also, also want to let you know that it'll create efficiencies and a, a reduction in overall costs in the process. Uh, lastly, we talked about the Bloor bike lanes, which, which is before us today. And I know there's a lot of my colleagues who have questions on this issue, so we'll look forward to that debate later today. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Menon-Wong, you have a motion to introduce the Striking Committee report. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, the report for meeting, 16, meeting 14 of the Striking Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Sorry, what are we talking about now? Councillor Grimes, you have a motion to introduce the Etobicoke York Community Council report. Yes, I do, and good morning, Madam Speaker. That the report from meeting 25 of the Etobicoke York Community Council list on the agenda for Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Algemeri, you have a motion to introduce the North York Community Council report. Thank you, Speaker, that the report from meeting 25 of the North York Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Councillor Lee, you have a motion to introduce the Scarborough Community Council report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, I do. And that the uh, report from meeting 25 of Scarborough Community Council listed on the agenda of Council be presented for consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Wong Tam, you have a motion to introduce the Toronto and East York Community Council report. 
Uh, yes, good morning, Madam Speaker, I do. Uh, and before I do, I'd just like to uh, mention that uh, this is in reflection. Oh, actually, you know, why don't I just read the motion? We'll start off with that. That the report from meeting 27 of the Toronto East Shore Community Council listed on agenda of council be presented for consideration. And also, just to say thank you to the clerks uh, who help us deal with 97 items at TYCC. Uh, and just to reflect and compare that to perhaps uh, Scarborough uh, Community Council, who dealt with uh, 24, North York Community Council, who um, administered and uh, sh shepherd 36 items, and of course, Etobicoke York with. Uh, 44 items. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, you have a motion to introduce the new business from city officials. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. That the new business from city officials listed on the agenda today of council be presented for consideration. Thank you. All those in favor of the motions, recorded vote. Councillor Peruzza and Councillor DiGiorgio, please. Councillor Ajumeri. Councillor Ajumeri, your vote, please. This is introducing the report. There haven't been introductions. The motion to introduce the reports carries unanimously 41 in favor. Councillor Ajumeri. CC 34.9. I'd like to uh, declare an interest. That's the next part of the meeting. Yeah. One of oh. the addresses, 100 Broadway, is uh, very near uh, property that I own. Okay. Thank you. So at this point, we, we, we go to our, are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the committee, the item or motion number, and the nature of the interest. So, Councillor McMahon. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Speaker, CD, um, oh my gosh, I need my glasses. It's page 6, CD 23.3, um, S.H. Armstrong uh, uh, Pool Working Group. I have a relative working uh, as a lifeguard now. Thank you. Councillor Shiner? Uh, TE 27.3, as I have an interest in a property in that area. Mayor Tory? Okay, okay, sorry. Councillor Shiner, the staff didn't get that. TE 27.3. Which page? Page 11. TE. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Tory? Uh, yes, a matter of fact, I have three. Uh, the first uh, is in respect of item PW24.4, improving accountability in the utility cut process. Uh, because of my uh, previous decla previously declared indirect relationship in Rogers Communications, uh, this uh, could, uh, could, could have an effect on them in terms of utility cuts. The second is item MM34.11, uh, the request to reinstate the Rogers Community Television Channel. Uh, for the same reason, and then the second one, the second, uh, the third one, uh, is item CC 34.7, 5565 Broadway Avenue zoning amendment application request for further direction regarding an OMB hearing, uh, and I'm declaring that interest out of an abundance of caution because my mother uh, owns a unit in the property that's adjacent. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. I will now call for petitions. Are there any petitions at this time, Councillor Fletcher? <coughs> oh. I think it's Fr Councillor Fragadakis there. Oh, that's fine. You're on your oh, okay. I'm on my feet. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, I'm sorry. It's, it's okay. Fletcher. It's all right. Okay. First of all, I'd just like to announce that my lights are all working, uh, Speaker, and everybody, so I can. And you're all my off. green lights working today. Uh, I have a 684 signatures, Speaker, to make Boltby Jones intersection safer with a four-way traffic light for my community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Ragadakis. 
Uh, thanks, Madam Speaker. So I have a petition with 200 signatures uh, with respect to item LS22.1, and it is in regards to the holiday shopping. And these people have signed a petition uh, saying that they would like to spend time with their families. Thank you. Councillor Kergiannis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Similarly to uh, Councillor Pagodakis' uh, petition, I also have a petition of 225 signatures. These are from people at all over Toronto that wish to spend time with their families on statutory holidays. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ainsley. Hi, good morning, Madam Speaker. I have a petition from 257 of my residents encouraging the Auditor General to do a value for money analysis of the Scarborough subway extension. Councillor Burnside. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a petition for, uh, in regards to PW 24.9, um, asking Council to um, go forward with the bike lanes on Bloor Street. It's from Leaside High School students, Aww. about 100 of them. Yay! Thank you. Good for All those in favor of receiving the petition's recorded vote. <clears throat> Councillor Kelly, Councillor Kergiannis, Deputy Councilor Mayor Minnawong, please. Councillor Mamalidi, please, thank you. The motion to receive the petitions carries unanimously 41 in favor. Thank you. Members, I will now review the order paper. We have two deferred committee items on this agenda, PG 21.6 on the Dufferin Wilson Regeneration Area Study, City Initiated Official Plan Amendment, Final Report, and EY 23.73 on Draft Approval of Condominium 2522-2542 Keel Street, Integrity, Transparency, Accountability, and Fairness in the Planning Process. There is a related item on the agenda EY 25.4 that I propose be considered with deferred item EY 23.73. The mayor has designated the following items as his key matters for this meeting. The first key matter will be item EX 26 point, uh, sorry, 28.6, headed advancing fair integration. And the second key item will, P, will be PW 24.9, headed Bloor Street bike lane pilot project evaluation. These will be our first and second item of business today. Notices and motions are scheduled to be dealt with at 2 p.m. tomorrow only if the mayor's key matters have been completed. I propose that City Council set a time for a closed session if required later in the, in the meeting. Page three. <coughs> Councillor Grimes. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Page three. Uh, EX 28.3 Public Transit Infrastructure Fund Phase 1 Update. I'd like to hold that, please. Thank you. Councillor Ajumeri. Thank you, Speaker. PG 21.6 Dufferin Wilson Regeneration Area Study. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza. Uh, that same item, Speaker. I'm good. Oh, okay, thank you. Page 4. If we can please clear the screen. Oh. Okay, if we can clear the screen. And, and members, if you can wait until the screen is cleared before you put your name on for the next page. So, Councillor Carroll, you had one on page three. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Yes, just one. Uh, EX 28.7, the Toronto Atmospheric Fund Board recommendation to amend open meeting requirements. Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Campbell, you're on page four. Councillor Campbell, page four. Uh, EX 28.21, results of interest arbitration with Toronto Professional Firefighters Association. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kergiannis. Madam Speaker, I'd like to release EX 28.13 on page four. Okay, so. Oh, you want to hold it? Continue? Okay. I'll hold it. Okay, thank you. 
will continue to be held. Councillor DiCiano, page four. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold EX 28.14, the development charge complaint 77 Glen Rush Boulevard. Thank you. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Uh, can I hold on page four? I just lost it. Uh, EX 28.20, non union cost limit adjustment. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. I'd like to hold EX 28.29, Support for Reform of the Municipal Class Environmental Assessment Process. Councillor Robinson, page four. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold two in a row, EX 28.18 and 28.19. Both are related to occupational health and safety reports. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher, page four. Yes, I'd like to hold EX 28.15, lease agreements with the Scarborough Rouge Hospital and YMCA of Greater Toronto for the development of the Bridal Town Community Hub. Thank you. Okay, if we can clear the screen, please. Page five. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I can release AU 10.5, Toronto Building Division Conditional Permits. Okay, on page 5, AU 10.5, Councillor Holliday would like to release it. Okay. I'll continue okay. to hold it. Continue then. to hold it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, I'd like to hold AU 10.8, obtaining the best value through the use of vendor rosters. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, uh, and the next one, uh, AU uh, 10.9. I may be able to get my questions answered offline, improving the effectiveness of the Basement Bloody Protection Program. Okay, Councillor Perks, is it on page five? Yes, it is. Okay, count, uh, page five, Councillor Perks. Uh, AU 10.10, .10, Auditor General's observation on the quantity of, of product realized from the city's single stream recyclable material blue bin program. Okay, thank you. We can clear the screen. Page six. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to hold uh, CD 23.6 Toronto Early Learning and Child Center Services projected center closures 2018 and HL 22.2, Minister's Expert Panel Report on Public Health in an Integrated Health System. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tan. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay, clear the screen, page seven. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, uh, Speaker, on LS 22.1, results of consultation on Chapter 510, Holiday Shopping, I'd like to release that and move the committee recommendation. I'd like to hold it. Then I'll hold it. Thank you. Okay. Stacy, her name. Madam Chair, the same item. Okay, it's be being held. Not, yet. Well, be not yet. We're not there yet. Okay, if we can clear the screen, please. Page 8. Councillor Cressy. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to hold item ST 14.7, Council Member Appointments to the Toronto Realty Agency Board. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Minnawong. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I'll hold um, Striking Committee 14.2, Appointments to Fill a Vacancy on the City School Board Advisory Committee and ST 14.4, <clears throat> without recommendations, appointment to fill a vacancy on the Canadian Stage Company Board. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Peruzza. Uh, yes, um, uh, page eight, uh, 14, um, ST 14.5, appointment to fill a vacancy on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. I'd like to hold that. Why? Why? 
I want to. Councillor Davis. Speaker, I wanted to go back to page seven. I'm sorry. Uh, under PG 23.4, area specific amendment to the city's sign by law 150 Sherway Drive. <clears throat> Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you. Okay, just a sec. Uh, is it on a particular? Seven. I, I one on seven. Okay, Councillor Perks on seven. Yes, uh, PG 23.5 area specific amendment to the sign bylaw for 153 Dufferin Street follow up. Okay. Councillor Layton. The items on page eight, rather than hold the item, I just wanted to, it is ST 14.14, appointment of council members to the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair. I'd just like to congratulate Councillor Carmichael Greb on her appointment. This uh, frees me up to compete in their amateur pickling and jam competition, of which this year I won a seventh place purple ribbon for my zucchini relish. <laughs> Councillor Matlow. <laughs> Councillor Matlow, page 8. Madam Speaker, uh, SD 14.8. Council member appointments to the Canadian National I'm Economic Exhibition. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. 14? SD 14.8. Council member appointments to the Canadian National Exhibition Association. Okay. Uh, Does he want to go? Page 9. <laughs> page 10. Councillor Pasternak, page 10. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold NY 25.12, uh, uh, NY 2527. And that's fine. You want more? Councillor Holliday. 12 and 27. Yes, Councillor Fragadakis. Sorry, on a point of order, when people, are, when members of council are asking to hold something, can they say the item number and what the item is? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Holliday. They, m most of them are. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I would like to hold uh, NY 25.36, request to qualify as a non, not-for-profit resident group, Willowdale Group of Artists. And I would also like simply a recorded vote on NY 25.3 Final Report Zoning Amendment Application 1580 Avenue Road. Okay. <clears throat> I think there's something wrong with the microphone. Okay, so Councillor Holliday is holding an item on page 10, NY 25.36. And on, N on page 10, NY 25.3, he's asked for a recorded vote. So on 25, NY 25.3, which is the final report, 1580 Avenue Road, recorded vote. Councillor Lee, please. Councillor Matlow. Councillor Peruzza. The item carries 35 to 5. Councillor Fillion. Um, NY 25.33, this action has already been taken, so I'm told that the... Okay, uh, can you read the item out, please? Yes, uh, and I want to remind members sure. of council, please read the item. Representation at Toronto Local Appeal Body hearing for 90 Johnston Avenue. The action that's being recommended here is, has already been taken, so I'm advised by the solicitor and clerks that the appropriate motion is that the item be received for information. Okay, on page 10, NY2533, Councillor Fillion is moving a motion to receive recorded vote.
Councillor Perks, Councillor Lee, and Councillor Davis. Councillor McMahon and Councillor DiGiorgio. A motion to receive carries 40 to 1. Councillor Karajanis. Madam Speaker, I'd like to release uh, SC 25.2. Uh, left turn prohibitions, Kennedy Road at uh, Reedmount Avenue, Maryland Avenue, and Bonus Avenue slash Cardwell Avenue. Okay, so on page 10, the bottom of the page, Council Chair Janice is releasing SC 2520. Yep. All in favor? Carried. Councillor Mahavik. Yes, page 4. Page 4. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. EX. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Mahavik, we're on page 10. Oh, sorry, my apologies, sorry. I was letting things go. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we, would you like a cup of coffee, maybe? <laughs> page 11. Councillor Pasternak, page 11. Uh, yes, I, uh, Madam Speaker, I, uh, I missed an item on... Um, on page 10 that the clerk has asked me to uh, hold for a technical amendment. If I could hold NY 25.32 on page 10. And can you please identify what the item sure, is? It's parking okay. amendments on Wilmington Avenue. Okay, so you're holding. I can move the motion now if you want. Okay, can we see the motion yeah, that Councillor Pasternak, you have a, a motion on parking am amendments for Wilmington Avenue. There it is on the screen. On favor, carry. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Holiday. We're on page 11. Indeed, we are. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I just would like to hold SC 25.2434 Horfield Avenue Amendment to Toronto Municipal Code Chapter 447 Fences. Uh, I just have some questions. I'll try to get them sorted out. Okay. Thank you. On page 12. Councillor Cressy. Thank you, Speaker. I have to hold TE 27.20 alterations to designate a heritage property's intention to designate under Part 4. It goes on. Okay. Pardon? I'm sorry. Councillor McMahon, at the top of page 12, T2711, 650 and 52 Kingston Road and 2 Main Street. Would you like to hold the item down? It's not on. That was, I, that's what I was standing for. They, they we're waiting, awaiting the report, and I will have a technical amendment with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Page 13. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. I uh, would like to request recorded votes on TE 27.28 application to remove two private trees, 56 Roxborough Street, and TE 27.30 application to remove a private tree, 35 Balmore Road. Thank you. Balmore. So Councillor Holliday on page 13 has asked for a recorded vote on T27.28 to remove uh, two private trees on 56 Roxborough Street. Recorded vote. Councillor Kelly, please. Councillor Lee. Councillor Prutza. Councillor Robinson. Councillor Mahavik, thank you. Councillor Crisanti, please. And Councillor Mamaliti, please. Councillor Prutza, your vote, please. Council, thank you. The item carries 34 to 7. On 
Page 13, EY 27.30, application to remove a private tree at 35 Bowmore Road. Recorded vote. Councillor Fillion, please. Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Mamaliti, please. Councillor Shiner. The item is adopted 35 to 6. Thank you. Mayor Tory. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. On page 13, item TE 27.46, construction staging area, 4 Avenue Road. I'd like to hold that, please. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. TE 27.44, Honda Indy Toronto Race, closure of Lakeshore Boulevard 2018 to 2020. Thank you. Page four, page fourteen. Councillor Dusset. Thank you, Madam Speaker. CC thirty-four point two, Toronto Real Estate Agency Board appointment of public members. I'd like to hold that, please. Okay. So, which one did you want? Councillor Cressy. Uh, Councillor Desset already held it. Oh, I can give it to you if you want, Joe. Page 15. Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to hold CC 34.10, Downtown East Planning Study, Official Plan Amendment, and Request for Directions. Uh, we're preparing a motion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Okay, should we do the urge? Councillor Fillion? The CC 34.11. Wait, well, we've already completed. Are you going back? Page 15. Page 15? It's on the same page. Yeah, because we had completed it. Okay. All right. Okay, please. Councillor Carroll, you have your name here? Uh, yes, uh, again, hoping to deal with it offline. Uh, CC 34.3 on page 14, the, the appointment to uh, local appeals body. I should be able to release it by lunch. Um, on page 14. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I thought we had completed. Um, well, we so haven't, we haven't voted back yet. Now? CC 34.3. 30, uh, Yes. What was it, Councillor Carroll? Page, page 14, CC yes. 34.3, the appointment of a public member to the local appeal body. Yeah. Okay, we're complete now, right? Yep. Okay, I thought we were. Okay. <laughs> My microphone, Madam Speaker? Yeah. Are there any... Request to make an item uh, urgent and time specific. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Speaker. I'm just uh, flipping to the audit committee on the page here. Uh, page number five. I'd like to time a couple of the audit committee items for the first thing tomorrow morning. I'm going to propose that AU 10.2, 10.3, and 10.4, all referring to the MLS audits, be timed for first thing in the morning followed by uh, the Auditor General's review of complaint regarding the June 29, 2016 Toronto Transit Commission briefing note, AU 10.11. Okay, so Councillor Holliday is moving 
on page 5 AU 10.2, 10.3, 10.4, and 10.11 tomorrow morning. Okay? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, right after uh, Councillor Holiday's uh, hold, I mean, uh, timed out item, I'd like to move uh, for page 7, LS 22.1. Results of consultation on Chapter 510, holiday shopping, to be timed right after uh, tomorrow morning. Well, it will probably be the afternoon. Yeah. So tomorrow afternoon. after. Yeah. Right after we're finished. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Carrie. Councilor McMahon? Well, since Wednesday's taken up already, I'll go for Thursday morning. <laughs> Even though you don't want to be here. Uh, so that would be the parks. Uh, I'm just trying to find it now. It's the Executive Parks Facilities uh, Master Plan, which is, sorry, EX28.2, uh, Parks and Recreation Facilities Master Plan, because we have consultants and we don't want them to sit around listening to us for day in, day out. So, Councilor McMahon, I didn't hear. You want to do? Uh, timed item Thursday at 9.30. Thursday. Since tomorrow's taken. So that's on page three, EX28.2. EX Thank you. All in favor? Carried. All right, so. Councillor McMahon, if you could uh, just move. Yeah, we're going through the items, so you have an interest in one item, so if you can just walk away for a minute. This is on CD 23.3, Councillor McMahon had an interest recorded vote. CD 23.3. Recorded vote. Councillor Prutza, Councillor DiGiorgio. Councillor Davis, please. Councillor Campbell, please. Councillor Holliday. Councillor Grimes and Councillor Troisi, please. Councillor Troisi, may we have your vote? Thank you. The item carries 38 to 2. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jumeir, you have an interest in the other one, I, other item? Yeah, which is CC 34.9, recorded vote. An interest that Councillor Hodgemary had. One hundred Broadway. Um. Councillor Grimes, please. Councillor Grimes, may we have your vote, please? Thank you. Councillor Shiner, please. The item is adopted 32 to 5. 
Thank you. Councillor Shiner, you have an interest on the next item. T T27.3. TE27.3. Recorded vote. The reason we're voting on it separately is because there's a, there was an interest that was declared. Councillor Perks, please. Councillor Peruzza. Councillor DiGiorgio. Mayor Tory, please. Councillor Bailao, when you're seated. The item is adopted unanimously, 39 in favor. Thank you. All those in favor of adopting the order paper and all items not held. All in favor? Carry. Pardon? Recorded? Councillor DiGiorgio, please. The motion to adopt the order paper carries unanimously 39 in favor. Matt, oh, Councillor Jamari. Thank you. Councillor Matt Lowe has held, <coughs> held an item CC 34.7, uh, 55 to 65 Broadway Avenue. I'd like to declare an interest in that pro property since I own property in the immediate area. That's another Broadway. Thank you, Councillor Jamari. Thank you. Okay, members of Council, I want to stress the importance of preparing your motions in advance. The clerk staff are here to help you prepare your motions, in particular if you intend to move a motion during the release of holds, I will insist that your motion be prepared in advance and given to the clerk. If you, okay, members of council, please. Councillor Carroll. If you do not have your motion ready, I will not recognize you. And I'm also reminding members that you must state your motion first before you speak to it. Member city council follows a, a routine uh, for the processing and adding of any motions without notice during the meeting. Please remember that a motion without notice must include a reason for urgency. If you have an urgent motion without notice you wish to bring forward at this meeting, please give your motion to the city clerk staff. They will prepare the ne necessary procedure motion for my review along with your motion. The chair must agree the motion is urgent before you can seek leave to introduce it at this meeting. It will require 30 votes to add a motion without notice to the agenda during the meeting. Motions added to the agenda in this way are not subject to a vote to waive referral to a committee or agency. I will be reviewing all motions carefully and will advise council after each recess which motions need a motion to add to the agenda. Now we'll go to the mayor's key item. Page 3, EX 28.6, which is advancing fair integration. But I just want to mention to the audience that's, uh, that, are, that is here that's for the licensing item, that's not being dealt with until tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll go to the mayor's key item, which is on page 3, EX 28.6. Questions? Questions to staff. If you can put your name up, request to question staff. Just a sec. Okay. 
I'm sorry, it's not tomorrow, it's Thursday, the licensing. It's tomorrow, Councillor Palacio. After the audit, uh, Councillor Palacio, please. Tomorrow. Councillor Campbell? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to ask some questions that I asked at the TTC Commission, and that's in regard to the uh, the means by which the TTC is uh, is paid back for the revenues foregone when somebody moves from the GO system to the TTC uh, system. Uh, the question is, so on, on page two of the report, it refers to uh, full year revenues uh, well, that will be paid by the province of 11.5 million and 11.8 million. And my question is, uh, at what point will, will the revenues that, are for, that, are, that the TTC does not take in on any given day, will they be paid back to the TTC uh, quarterly, monthly, semi-annually? Uh, uh, Councillor Campbell, hold on. Can I have some quiet, please, in the council chambers? Councillor Ford, members of council, please. Okay, sorry, thank you. Okay, Councillor Campbell. The question, the question is in regard to the frequency, uh, the frequency with which the TTC will be uh, repaid back by Metrolinx. So the, the, it will be on a minimum of a monthly basis on a monthly basis. And have we discussed, as I, again, as I, and Arthur, you know you, I, I've asked this question at the TTC, I'll ask it again now. Have we discussed a situation where the, uh, where the, the Presto card holder would pay the full fare to the TTC, but upon tapping onto the TTC would receive a discount to their account rather than, rather than the TTC not receiving the money from the Presto card? So that's not the way the Presto system is currently designed, so that would have to be uh, uh, investigated to see whether that was possible. So how is it working between the other GTA municipalities if somebody is going from Mississauga to Brampton or from Brampton to York, if they're, if they're going about, or if they're going from Go to, you know, My Way, how, how, is, it, how is it working between all of those, those transit networks? So between the other municipalities and GO, it would be exactly the same as, the, as what is before Council today in terms of a uh, discounted rate is charged. Um, the other municipal agencies have uh, their own agreements in place where the, rather than it being a discounted rate, it's, um, uh, a, there is no charge when you're transferring between one municipality and another transit agency. So is the, is the GO, is the GO, um, you know, is the GO discounted fare system already in place with Mississauga, Peel, York, and Durham? Correct. It has been for many years. It has been for many years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's all my questions. You can turn off my microphone. Well. Thank you. Councillor Davis, questions to staff. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I wanted to understand uh, first, this is for a, to be implemented for a term from whenever this is executed uh, to 2020, so essentially a two-year term? It would, be, um, it would be just over two years. Okay. And the term, it seems to suggest that if the projected costs exceed um, more than what Metrolinx had projected, then the whole thing is sort of opened up again for renegotiation. Is that right? So the, we would review exactly what the projections would be to determine exactly if the, uh, what additional subsidy would be required to continue uh, the, the program and would um, discuss um, changing the terms of the agreement um, with Metrolinx and uh, the province. So th 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 those two years at any point we could find ourselves um, having to renegotiate this? Or is it at... Te technically, yes. Okay. One of the things it requires is no fare increase. So does that mean there'll be no fare increase for two years? Is that what we are binding ourselves to? No, we are saying that if there is a fare increase, that right. um, as, 
as we are currently setting up um, the review process. During that, as part of that review process, we would assess the potential impact of that fare increase and see whether there would be need for any changes to the agreement. No, I, okay. So all I'm saying is that if the fares change, it has to be reopened as well. Correct. Okay. Um, one of the issues that concerns me has to do with w the direction overall of the fare integration work that Metrolinx is doing. And they seem to indicate uh, a couple of things. That they are going to a fare by distance model. Is that your sense? They are going to a fare by distance model. I don't believe that they have stated that. Um, so far, I believe that <clears throat> they, they have um, explored that in great detail and believe that that is um, where that they would they think that there is the greatest potential to increase ridership and revenue, um, but they um, agree with um, our um, perspective and other municipal agencies that there are some significant operational uh, considerations that need to be um, assessed before the, that change could be made. Right, but in their presentation, there's about four places where they talk about going in that direction and, and talk about it being um, their they don't use the word preferred option, but it sounds like that is the direction they're going. I guess I'm just asking if that's a fair assessment in your opinion. Um, I think it would be fair to say that that would be their preference. Okay. Now we have always taken a position that fare by distance um, would have an impact within the 416 and TTC um, City of Toronto jurisdiction. And so I'm wondering how that position from the city is being communicated to Metrolinx, um, or is it? it? It is, and it has been uh, communicated through me directly um, through the sessions that we've been having with Metrolinx and the other municipal agencies um, over the last two years, um, and will continue um, through the specific working groups that are being set up at the moment um, to, um, to focus on each of the step-by-step -step implementation, uh, implementation um, options that have been set out uh, by Metrolinx. It's very hard to hear you on this side. <laughs> if you could speak up. Uh, the other question I have, um, one of the issues identified in the most recent Metrolinx report has to do with a governance change and the need for changes in decision making. How is the decision making going to uh, roll out and what is the role for the elected officials in the City of Toronto or the TTC Commission that has legislative authority to set fares within uh, the TTC system? Where are those and how are we decisions taking place and how are we going to be involved in them? I think it's fair to say that um, those discussions are, have yet to take place in any detail. Um, there are no um, specific um, uh, targets other than um, an acknowledgement that um, there is a need to look at how um, we uh, would need to set fares in the future should we change, need to change, want to change the fare structure. That was your last question. Councillor Layton. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. How long has the, city, has the City of Toronto advocated for an integrated fare system like this with Metrolinx? Through the Speaker, we, uh, we raised that in July of 2016, uh, initially in our, in, in our report. It, it may have been, a, we've been advocating before then for a co-fare arrangement similar to what the uh, what other municipalities, municipalities have. Do, have. Can, can you date back when the first request was made by this chamber? To uh, Would it require carbon dating? Would it <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have that date. You don't have that, that nature. But it's safe to say the past several terms of council have been asking for a similar arrangement. That's then. correct. What did um, the other jurisdictions, they didn't have Presto before the City of Toronto on their local transit systems, did they? Uh, yes, they did. We are the last agency within the region to get Presto. So, but was the, did their, their co-pay system predated Presto? Correct. So they were able to figure out how Presto and the, uh, and, and, or pre-Presto, how a GoTrain fare and uh, a local system fare could 
could provide a co-payment system of some kind. Correct. However, our transit system is very different to the other agencies which are in the main just bus systems um, where customers are interacting with a driver on a bus um, at every uh, point of entry to the system. Fair enough. Is it safe to say that the Presto system changes the game in this instance that uh, gives us an opportunity to integrate the fare in a means that hasn't been possible before at the City of Toronto? Correct. What is, um, what's the timeline moving forward? What, like this is, this is kind of a, a partial integration. What, what's the timeline moving forward? There's, there's reference to it, but it doesn't give us a, 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 a path, really, a, so, a schedule for how this will happen. Through the speaker, forward. we don't have a firm schedule from Metrolinx on, on further steps on fare integration. They are consulting on fare integration and some of the materials that their board considered through um, broader consultations on the regional transportation plan uh, at present. And we do expect that further, uh, they may be making further, uh, or taking further action uh, over the next several months before the, the uh, provincial election. Okay. Um, just finally, the cost per kilometer of a current GO train trip within the city of Toronto, safe to say they're the highest cost per kilometer? Um, through the, through the speaker, uh, I'm not sure if we can say that they're the highest cost per kilometer, but what we did show in, in July, uh, in our paper in July on fare integration, that, that they are disproportionately, from some of the stations we examined, they're disproportionately high, and that, that residents in Toronto pay more per kilometer in general. Can you than, tell us what the most expensive trip is on go per kilometer? I can. The, the one that we profiled was the, uh, the trip from Exhibition Station to Union Station, which is a relatively short trip at uh, just under, uh, somewhere between $1.50 and $2 per kilometer. So if I could just have one last question, and that's the success of the number of riders uh, working uh, on a new RER smart track network, is that directly dependent on a co-fare that's commensurate with an existing TTC fare, will that see the most increase in ridership? Uh, through the speaker, it's fair to say that, uh, that fare levels have a direct impact on ridership and that the, uh, the lower the go fare, the higher the ridership will be on, on RER. And perhaps I think I'll, Metrolinks recognize Perhaps I'll rephrase the question then and say, in the modeling that we've done around the success of Smart Track yes. and RER in the city of Toronto, the most successful model that we have has the GO train, uh, at the, the RER Smart Track TTC cost as one fare, and that's the TTC fare. Through the speaker, you are correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Uh, yes, Madam Speaker. Um, my, my question is, is to do with the TTC uh, terms. And uh, uh, similar to Councillor Layton's questions, I was concerned with what's the timing of future reviews, because this is really sort of a first step. Um, and the triggers for review of agreement, uh, it has the 2020 review. Uh, uh, if, if the whole thing is fully operational by then, there'll, there'll then be a review in 2020. Am I reading that right? The review will happen regardless? So, so the review will start um the, the first meeting is actually being set up right now to set out exactly what that review will entail and the data that will be required, and then that will happen on a quarterly basis. Oh, on a quarterly basis? Throughout, throughout the entire ah. term. Okay, that makes me feel better. Uh, is there a concern? I, I note that it says if the TTC introduces a fair increase during the term of the agreement, agreement then, then the, the, the initiative gets revisited. But will we be allowed to advocate at that point, you know, uh, make us whole? If we've had to do a fair increase, we'll have to make our case for, for why it is we're doing a fair increase. But then the fair integration credit piece would, would be adjusted to continue to make us whole. Is that the intention of reviewing at the point of each fair increase? So um, at the moment, the way that the, the, the fair discount is set up, um, it's a 50% um, off of an adult fare. Should we increase the, 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 the fare for an adult, then it ceases to be that 
Right, so discount. the adjustment would continue so to be on a percentage basis. Well, so the discussion would then be whether we wanted, whether the province would want to fund um, continuing on a 50% basis or um, continue on the dollar value discount that that represents today, which is a dollar fifty. Okay. Last question then. Um, I've, I've been concerned all along that uh, the, the other shoe will drop for GTA systems when they are running rail transit. All of them are running bus systems right now. They're about to find out how much it costs to have an integrated system and rail within that, you know, once the Huron Ontario line is running. And if this whole thing gets reopened, and we're talking fair integration, but they're trying to cover their operating costs, is it open for TTC at that point to begin to discuss? Do you really want to make a real contribution to operating, which would make everyone's fares affordable? There potentially, there's an opportunity to do that. We're not closing the door to that conversation by entering into the fair credit system. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay, before we continue, I'd like to welcome the students from Ryerson Masters of Journalism students and Councilor Wong Tam's ward. Um, speakers, we're into speakers. Councillor Councillor Layton, you're you're the only speaker. Count, count, okay, just one sec, okay. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have uh, advanced circulated a motion that City Council direct the City Manager to request Metrolinx and the Toronto Transit Commission to accelerate their plans for full afford and affordable fare integration for the City of Toronto, including a single fare for rides within the City of Toronto, and to report back to City Council. Um, there, it, this has been many, many years in the coming, and I celebrate Metrolinx and the TTC for coming forward with this report, but I would challenge them that it doesn't go far enough. Uh, essentially, uh, we went from an $8 fare to get from Liberty Village, which employs 15,000 15, people, uh, 15, people living there as well. Uh, we're, we're charging them six fifty instead of 8 bucks to get uh, from, from Liberty Village down to Union Station, and, 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 or on at Union Station. Um, that's, a, th that's still too much. If we want the RER, Smart Track, whatever you call it, if we want this, service, uh, this surface transit system to work to its most effective level, we need to draw people onto that, and we know from our modeling what does that is an affordable, one fair system for the City of Toronto. I don't think that this council chamber will support a sit different fare coming from Scarborough, a different fare coming from Etobicoke, and a different fare coming from North York. And don't get me wrong, that fare by distance probably stands to benefit the residents of Trinity Spadine in my neighborhood, in Liberty Village. But I think, and I speak on behalf of them, uh, as they've elected me, that I don't think they think that would be right. That we should be having different fares coming from different parts of the city of Toronto. We are one city. Let's have one fare. And let's make this, whatever you call it, system that we have on surface transit planning that we're going down, work for the city of Toronto. It may require us to pay more, both in the fare box as well as from the tax base. It very well may. And it will, we should have that debate. We should have that debate sooner rather than later. It has been six years since, since we first started, or, or since last council started bringing into the language of fair integration. I am sure colleagues of ours had been doing this for a decade before that. It's not fair that other municipalities were getting a co fare system where they were charging 60 cents to riders of their system that got off the go. It's not fair. And I'm happy that we have this before us now, but I challenge, again, that we're not going far enough. And that that fare should be a single fare system for the City of Toronto to make, it fair, to make it fair for everyone, but as well to make our next system work. We already know it'll, it'll only work, and it, or it'll work, work better and have more riders if we go for a fare like this. So why would we not make that position very known from this chamber that our expectation is that it be a single fare for the City of Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question for you. 
Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you for the uh, the motion. So, are you suggesting, and I do, uh, this is this is clarification. Um, are you suggesting that whether or not you get on a go service, a bus, or or a train, or TTC within the boundaries of the City of Toronto, that it be the same as a TTC fare? I don't think it would be getting just getting on. I think if your travel is within the City of Toronto boundaries where you might take an RER, one stop, and then hop on. Like, let, let me just, one route. So I, I live in Liberty Village. I don't, but I, let's pretend that I do. Um, I walk down to the exhibition place, a, a go train station. I hop on, go to Union, because I work up in, in North York. That trip, that seven minute ride on the, L, uh, on the uh, go train, and then the, the trip from Union up to whatever stop at North York, North York Civic Center, uh, that should be one fair, I believe. Now, if you're getting on and then riding outside of the system, the, the brilliance of Presto, if, if we are to call it brilliant at any point in time, which probably won't happen ever again, far. wouldn't go that far, is that you can have that tap on and tap off and you can travel on multiple systems. I would just say that you shouldn't charge a different amount to someone coming downtown from Etobicoke as you would someone going from downtown to downtown or from Etobicoke to another Etobicoke station. Uh, that that fair should be one. So it, should, so it should be one fare, right, I get that, one fare, one continuous fare, one, one tap-on, basically, is what you're saying. Within the City of Toronto. Within the City of Toronto, okay. So the, then the other question comes, I mean, I, 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 I think this is a great idea. I, I applaud the motion. I just wish, wish it was more specific, because what does affordable mean? <laughs> so you're asking the city manager to, and the, the head of Metrolinx to make a, a determination as to what's affordable. I, I don't think I was in, in, in the precise position to, to figure out what that, the, the cost might be. There, there may be any number of, uh, of, uh, of, of inputs, but I think as Councillor uh, Perks is pointing out right now in my ear, that uh, it's a principle that I think is, is, is worth following. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. I'm just trying to uh, determine, uh, Councillor, with all of the new transit that's being built, the Smart Track, Eglinton Cross Town, um, and particularly the Smart Track, six stations that members of my community and members of your community will be able to get on, are, uh, as well as those up on the Stouffville line, the other lines. Are you concerned that this will introduce another fair or that it would be difficult to get people to cross over if they're paying more money? Well, I, I think that the preliminary findings of some of the reports that staff have done for us around RER and Smart Track really do point to a single fare that is, is equivalent to a TTC fare in order to increase ridership. The only way that we're going to reduce congestion in our city is increasing transit ridership. If that's the goal of RER and Smart Track and our TTC working together as a public transit system, then we should, we should make it uh, or, or reduce the barriers that exist to increasing that, uh, that, that ridership number. And are you concerned that we may be spending a couple of billion dollars on stations for Smart Track and that if the fare is too high or there's not proper integration, citizens and residents just aren't going to be getting on the smart track. They're not going to get on at that station. So I may not have run uh, my election on, on, on smart track, but I've been quite clear that I think that there are opportunities to integrate our existing GO train lines and provide more stations on them in order to uh, provide some relief, particularly in the west end of downtown, but perhaps also in the east. Uh, to our transit system in order to provide the capacity and the comfort to those riding to increase that number. Uh, so I'm quite happy to get up and say, I want to see it work. And if staff are saying that we're going to attract the largest number of riders, if we have one affordable fare, then I'm prepared to, uh, uh, to say that now, make that position known to Metrolinx, and, now, and, and empower the city manager to go and fight for that until, uh, until it comes back to City Council, and hopefully sooner rather than later. So you're, uh, I gather you're feeling it's very important we establish that as a principle in order to make sure that we have uh, riders as we move forward to uh, develop and build out these new stations that we're paying for. 
Okay, we have to clarification of the motion. Yeah, I'm I think, clarifying. I, I, think I, I want to know how strongly he feels this has to happen before we actually proceed all over and uh, continue to proceed. Very strongly. Yes. So, unless we have this, we shouldn't proceed. Is that what you're saying? Well, we, we need to make it clear to Metrolinx what our expectation is in this discussion. Um, maybe it's a starting point. Maybe we're standing firm. Um, I trust that our city manager will, will have the best interests of, uh, of this council uh, in mind when he approaches the province. And quite frankly, that the mayor will work to try to make uh, RER smart track work in our city simply because uh, he's ran on this and it's his, uh, his legacy that he's leaving the city. I think he wants to see it work too. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, through you to Councillor Layton, I, I want to get my head wrapped around the intent of the motion as it applies to, say, somebody that lives in the West End. So, Councillor Layton, uh, if I can just lay out the example. If I take the, uh, the, uh, the Metrolinx train from Kipling Go Station into Union Station, I think I just checked, it's $5.60. If I remember, the ride is about 20 minutes, depending on traffic in the morning. I can spend 325 and I can take the subway from the same station across Bloor and down to Union Station in about 40 minutes. Same place, same destination, two different pieces of equipment. Is your proposal then to make it the same fare whether I take one mode or the other? Yes. Yes. And, and further, that if you actually need to go to, let's say, uh, Dundas and Young, at the end of the day, you're heading to the Eaton Centre, let's say. It's Boxing Day, yep. subway's going to be packed, you're bringing some big parcels, that you'd be able to go you, transition at Union onto the subway and take those three stops rather than walking in the cold. Got it. So to keep things equal, and assuming that the cost of the train is a little bit more than the unit cost of the subway, does that mean that TTC fares would also rise? So it may not be 325 in, anymore, it may actually be a higher number, and maybe the fare of the GO train will go down in order to harmonize it. Is that okay? Is that okay that the TTC fare will then go up? So, so sadly, because, uh, because this chamber over the last several decades has decided not to fund transit from the tax base and instead rely on the rate base, fares are going up anyhow. Yeah. Fares will continue to rise. This will be an answer, or, or the, the answer to that question about whether or not this will involve a direct increase in the, in the price of transit will, will entirely depend on what the province does with their, uh, uh, with, with their subsidy to transit fares, as well as with what this chamber does with our subsidy uh, to transit fares. But uh, what I don't think it's fair, and why I say it should be uh, the same cost if you live in Etobicoke as if you live in Liberty Village, is because I don't think what we want to do is start to discourage ridership because it's more expensive to travel from a further distance, uh, for instance, north Etobicoke, uh, and, and take that, uh, take that that, that train down rather than spend 40 minutes on the subway. I think that we need to set a principle that it's one city, it's one fare, we all get treated equally here. But you didn't answer the question in terms of this motion. Does this motion then give the effect that the TTC fare is going to have to go up no. regardless of the funding because that's all going on whether or not you place the motion, but the motion to harmonize the fares could cause the TTC, could give effect for the TTC fare to go up, is that correct? I do not think that, that's, uh, uh, that, that that would be a direct result. That'll be a, a result of the decisions we try to make about how we fund transit from that point forward, if it's from the tax base or the fare box um, or the property tax base from the City of Toronto. Thank you. That was your last question. Councillor Grimes, <coughs> clarification of motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Councillor Layton, I know uh, You've been working on this a while, and you're kind of in the same boat I am with Liberty Village with Humber Bay Shores. Two communities that exploded. Uh, I mean, can we wait for Smart Track to come in, in your mind, to, uh, I know as you're asking to accelerate the plans, and if, can we wait? Or do we have to do something now in your mind? So Presto has offered us an opportunity to test some of the theories that staff are right now writing reports and developing theories on themselves. Why wouldn't we start? to play around with fares, to, 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 to see what would it take to get people out of their cars, off of the, the Bloor line, and onto the, the Lake, in this case, the Lakeshore West line, but also the uh, Georgetown line that runs up through Councillor Bailao's and Councillor Nunziata and, and Councillor uh, DiGiorgio's ward. What would it take? We, we've got a living, living laboratory. We don't need to pay 
uh, to, to, to pay a, a multinational corporation to put sensors and sidewalks when we have the Presto card and we can start playing around with what would it take to actually get people to, uh, to ride that system? I think Councillor Campbell asked the question, uh, what's affordable? Um, and what it would be from Liberty Village? I know you get on exhibition. What does it cost if you had to take the go now and get the, on the TTC? What, what, what's the cost? Five ten to take the uh, at least at last time I checked to take the go train, and then you pay three twenty five at the uh, at the fare box. Do you believe your residents that live in Liberty Village think that's affordable? Well, we know eight fifty one way is not an affordable uh, is not an affordable way of getting downtown. Uh, you may as well spend the extra hour and a half traveling every day uh, for the for the TTC fare, or you may as well walk. What would a taxi cost you from Liberty Village to downtown? Depends on what time of day. Thank you. I support your motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mamalidi. Uh, I'm not going to support your motion, but <coughs> I, I'm just. Uh, we need my clarification, clarification is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty clear with that. My 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 question is uh, is is whether or not this thing. Uh, should should even exist this motion, or whether it should be replaced with a motion that suggests that Metrolinx take o takes over the whole system, TTC and and uh, uh, just allow the province to run a system for everybody. Well, this is not clarification of the motion, Councillor Mamaliti. But I'm wondering whether or not he would accept a friendly amendment. No, Count Councillor Mamaliti, please. I, I believe with the government structure that Metrolink says, I don't think it would well serve. No, Councillor Layton, you don't need to answer that. It's not even pertaining to your motion. Well, then, so then maybe this one does. Um, how, what, what would be the cost to the actual taxpayers? Uh, we, we've learned from you that, that it's going to be, the rates are going to increase <coughs> for the, for the uh, ridership. What's the actual cost to the taxpayers if this motion goes through in subsidies? Uh, Councillor, I, I, I don't have an answer to that about the amount because I don't think it's clear what that would cost. We are in a negotiation with another level of government around what the, what the fair subsidy would be and what the financial uh, relationship will be between the city and Metrolinx. And I think that that's, uh, that, that's a, a, a very good question and one that I think the city manager would bring back to us as a result of those negotiations, as well as a strategy to pay for it. Is it going to come from uh, the tax base, or is it going to come from the fare box? And I think I think your residents would, as well as mine, would agree that that we'd much prefer to keep transit affordable in the city because those that rely on it most are those of lower income brackets. And I think by keeping the fare uh, the the same across the city, I, I think you'd certainly agree that that would be a more ideal uh, situation for your residents, well, uh, as it would be for many other residents in the city of Toronto that don't live in the downtown core. That, that would stand to be hurt by a fair by distance, uh, uh, a fair by distance approach. I appreciate you telling me what my residents would want, uh, but I can t I can tell you unequivocally that my residents do not want this motion to go through for a couple of reasons. One, there will be a cost to the taxpayer, and two, they don't want to pay any more money to come downtown uh, by 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 TTC. Okay, Councillor Mamaliti, that's not. Well, thank not... you for that, but okay. but uh, okay, thank you're you. not accurate. All right. Councillor Davis to speak. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I have a motion that requests the City Manager to develop and report to City Council on a proposed governance model for Metrolinx to ensure a transparent and formal decision-making process for regional transit decisions, including fare integration. Um, we have before us uh, a report that advances our agenda with respect to fares uh, in the City of Toronto. Finally, there is a recognition that there will be a co-payment system and there will be a discount of $1.50 for people who are getting on the go line. Uh, it's very important in uh, Councillor Layton's ward. It's very important in my ward as uh, Councillor uh, McMahon will confirm that we have uh, the main subway station across the road from the Danforth Go. And we need to ensure as a certainly an interim step for uh, downtown relief to encourage people to get on that Go train. But right now there is no incentive to do that. 
We will see if the $1.50 co-payment will increase uh, those people who are willing to make that connection. Um, I will be supporting uh, the recommendation before us. Uh, the agreement is for two years. It means that though any time there are fair changes, any time the revenue assumptions are not what the provincial government expected, that the, it will all be renegotiated. So it is a loose agreement that uh, can also be cancelled with 90 days notice. So it is an exploratory next step and it will obviously move us uh, forward to getting a more integrated approach. But one of the big issues, even identified in this report, it says that a formal, inclusive decision-making process needs to be put in place to establish long-term fair structure vision. We have seen that Metrolinx, over the last several years, has made decision-making made decisions behind closed doors, decisions that have been uh, politically motivated. We have seen how the provincial government that seems to act with the shortest arm to this arm's length agency imaginable has made decisions that have not been necessarily in the interest of our city. We have talked for many years and Councillor Holliday, we have discussed governance changes for many years, but we have never actually taken the time or begun to discuss what that might look like. They simply asked the city manager to bring back to us something that ensures that when we invest in a more integrated regional system, we have a voice. Right now that voice is a panel of citizens appointed by the provincial government. And while I know that the challenge of having political representation on a regional body is, um, is challenging as well, I don't believe for a moment that we can continue to let this decision-making body, Metrolinx, determine our transit priorities, determine a fair integration structure and impose it on our city while at the same time we are going to pick up 100 percent of the operating costs of all LRTs. We are going to operate those LRTs. We are going to be paying 100 percent for the smart track stations. All of these things integrate us in a way that requires us to have a stronger voice in this regional network when it comes to governance. And I believe we need to begin to lead that discussion instead of leaving it to Metrolinx and the provincial government. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Campbell. Thank Clarification. Well, Madam Speaker, is this motion in order, or is this motion any more in order than if we were to ask <coughs> the city manager to report on why uh, meetings of the cabinet are held in secret? Why well, I don't have a copy of the motion. Do you have a copy of that? If, if it's a question I, of I, me. I believe it is in order, Councillor Campbell. Oh. Are you certain, Madam Speaker? I'm certain. <laughs> Look on page nine of the attachment of the it's report. It's a report request. So, okay, so I would like clarification of, of the motion then. Uh, is, the, is the intent to ask the city manager's opinion on the governance structure at Metrolinx and whether or not it's fair? We have taken a position. That's FAIR, right? So. We have taken a position, Councillor, several times that we believe the Metrolinx governing structure should be changed. It's a yes or no. It is not a yes or no. It's a yes or no. Is that is And the, if, if, excuse me. Okay, Councillor Carroll, please. It's not Councillor Carroll, it's Councillor no, Campbell. No. Councillor <laughs> yes Carroll no was question. disrupting. Okay, okay. so Councillor Campbell, please allow Councillor Davis to answer the That's question. I'm using my five minutes. So, if you would it's look at minutes. page nine in the attached document that is in our report, Metrolinx itself 
recognizes a need for a new governance model. We recently had a briefing from Metrolinx on their next five-year plan. What is at the end as one of their priorities? A need to review the governance model. The question is, who is going to develop that? What are the various ways that things we should be looking at? This simply asks our city manager to give us some okay. advice. Councillor Davis, thank you. Councillor Campbell, do you have another yeah, question? No, no, no. She's, that's fair enough. She's answered the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fletcher to speak. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I'm just going to strongly support <coughs> Councillor Layton's motion here. And for the very reasons uh, that I was getting to in my questioning. And in particular, we are embarking on a very ambitious transit plan with Metrolinx <coughs> and a, trans a very Im a transit plan that would have all of our TTC vehicles and TTC routes touch base with the GO system. And we are indeed going to be building six new stations. We here in this council uh, have agreed or are in the process of agreeing to building six new stations on the GO line, which would mean that all of those residents, all of those commuters that are touching that GO station would have an option to stay on the TTC or to get off and move on the GO line and the RER at a smart track station. And so it makes a lot of sense to me that we can't price our commuters out of the market. They have to be able to want to get on stations that we're building. They have to feel like that this is a useful thing for them. And I don't want to see empty stations or people not riding on these, these uh, on the RER, on the GO line, going to our smart track stations because they think it's too much money. So this is the part, this is the uh, part that we have now come to after I think it's uh, 11, 12, um, a number of months anyway, maybe two years, going on three years where we've been discussing the matter of the smart track stations, how we're going to integrate. Only now are we talking about the money side, the people that ride our transit the people that ride the GO lines, the people that ride TTC, and how they're going to make a smooth connection between one system to another. Not by increasing how much they're going to pay overall, because we know that will have a negative impact, and we have a very robust poverty reduction strategy. We have to get people to their jobs. And I'm very concerned that this is only coming up now. And I'm glad that Councillor Layton made this motion, talking about an affordable, fair integration for two systems, because we are building, we're integrating with another system on the GO line, and also um, we have to take into account that we are also paying for those stations. So if we don't have a clear direction that we're going to give to the city manager and others in these conversations with Metrolinx, that would be unfortunate. I think it's time that we're talking about our residents and their ability to get on transit in the city and travel from one end of it to the other in an affordable way, get off the TTC and get into a smart track station and on the go line come in on the go, get on the TTC, make it simple, affordable, and easy. And uh, therefore, I would urge all of you to support the motion that Councillor Layton has placed in front of us today. Thank you. Councillor Shan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm also writing to put my strong support behind uh, Councillor Layton's motion. Uh, I think it's fairly important for us to recognize that uh, some of the long rides that uh, people take aren't out of choice. In fact, most of the services are located far from them. Most of the employment areas are located far from them. 
Um, so it's very important for us to kind of not add on to the burden that people have to travel longer to get to a workplace from northeast corner of Scarborough or northeast corner of Etobicoke, uh, uh, Eto northwest corner of Etobicoke. Now, it is also important that we consider that uh, accessible and affordable transit as a social determinant of health. Uh, we are seeing that the health impacts in, in communities that are further away from downtown through research after research showing that uh, there is disparities and disproportional impact on people's health, amount of time they have with children, amount of time they have for recreational activities and so on. So to, for, the, for the rest of the city uh, from far away to be connected to entertainment, to sports, to all the fun things that are happening and so on, uh, as it is right now, we need to be able to make that affordable. And the only way to do that is not to get tied into a fair system that actually uh, takes into consideration distance uh, within the city of Toronto. And we are also struggling still to make sure that everybody feels part of one Toronto. And it's not a reality, even though some may believe that's happened already. In fact, many parts of the city of Toronto still feel like they're not fully in on the whole thing as a beautiful city has to offer. So I would strongly support what uh, Council Layton is putting forward. Uh, it, is, it is something that needs to be looked through equity lens. It may mean that there might be a slight increase, but it ultimately what it means is that more people will be using transit because they can change from one system to the other easily with one fare. If more people do use transit, it's going to be better for us in dealing with real way to deal with congestion on Don Valley Parkway and other highway routes as well. So I'm, I'm strongly in support of it. I also want to support uh, Councillor Davis' motion for transparency and accountability. Even though it may look like we are dictating or directing to another system, another, another level of government, in fact, by fair integration, we are in fact tying ourselves to that system. By fair integration, we are also tying our services to that system. So um, as, as some sort of a convenience of, of collaboration, happens, we also need to make sure that we are not tied into poor decision making, we are not tied into unaccountable system. I'm not saying it is currently there, but it's in fact a necessary step for us to look at accountability and transparency as we move forward uh, with decisions I'm making because we by default of associating our fares, we by default of associating our services to another system, we are tied into the decision making whether we like it or not. So it's in fact a very, fairly appropriate for us to look for a better system of decision making in the metro links, a b better standards of transparency uh, when decisions are made. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just uh, rise in uh, support of Councillor Layton's motion. Uh, he's been on this for a while, and I've supported his motions before uh, with regards to uh, exhibition place and his people trying to get down, his residents trying to get down to downtown. It's taking far too long. He recognized the same problem I have at Humber Bay Shores. Um, there's... Um, a couple weeks ago, you probably saw in the media, one of my residents uh, tried to start his own bus uh, running from Humber Bay Shores to the Mimico GO station because it's just unbelievable getting downtown and uh, back home at nighttime. A resident showed me online the other day, he could have walked home from downtown faster than the transit coming back to Parkland Lakeshore. He could have walked home, showed the time walking and the time the transit to get back to home. So that is ridiculous. We have to move on this, and I fully support Councilor Layton on this. I know through the Master Transportation Plan, we are looking at um, having a bus running, the TTC running up to uh, the GO station. So with that, I'm, I'm not going to move a motion, because I'm sure it would be ruled out of order, but I hope that the TTC would take this into account. I know Andy Byford and his team probably will for sure, and I'm going to make sure they do, but uh, I just want to stand and rise and uh, congratulate the Councilor Layton on bringing this forward once again. Thank you. Okay, so last speaker, Mayor Tory. Well, Madam Speaker, thank you, and I want to thank all those who have uh, intervened in this discussion and indicate that I as well will be supporting uh, Councillor Layton's motion because I think Councillor Layton's motion really just uh, sets out quite clearly what our objective is as a council and as a city on behalf of the people we serve, which is to create one seamless system where people can get around on the payment of one reasonable fare because that uh, is something that's been discussed in some of, some of the remarks that have been made um, and that it be something that is consistent uh, across the city and I think that is something we all share as the objective. We're now entering into obviously a, or, or are continuing on a negotiation that a number of speakers have made reference to that is complicated. I went to a couple of the meetings I described it 
uh, at some meeting rather I was at in the last little while as an eye glazing meeting because what you had there of course was you had the province you had Metrolinx and they're not one and the same you had I think it was nine transit systems represented from Peel and, and you know you name it they were all there and you had us there as the city of Toronto and you could just see in the room that everybody, depending on what chair they sat in, uh, obviously had perhaps a slightly different uh, objective that they wanted to come out with. But the bottom line was, to me, that was encouraging. There's two things that are encouraging. Number one, that those people were all in a room and that there was an agenda and that there was discussion going on about creating this seamless, integrated, fair system for the region. And that's a good thing. Um, and secondly, the second good indication or good sign is this agreement. And I want to endorse as well the comments that uh, Councillor Layton and others have made, Councillor Davis and others who have spoken. This is not the answer. This is a modest step forward. I want to commend and thank the province for the fact that they're putting up uh, the money to make this happen. But clearly, if you just take the one inequity alone that has been referred to by Councillor Layton in regard to people that he and I both heard from a couple of weeks ago in Liberty Village where they still are going to have to pay even after the 150 some outrageous sum of money to go a very short distance and to get themselves around the city other than in a car or on foot on a bad winter day or whatever or just if they generally want to take transit obviously it's not acceptable it's not acceptable in and of itself and it's still not acceptable because there continues to be an inequity between how this city and its people are being treated relative to residents of other parts of the region because as has been noted uh, by a number of those who, are, who have spoken um, this, we are the last municipality to have any agreement of this kind. Other agree, uh, municipalities have had these agreements for a long time and quite frankly, the ones that are in place today um, are uh, more generous uh, in terms of the arrangement it makes for their uh, residents than this one does for ours. And you might say, well, uh, you know, should we therefore have walked away uh, from this? I think the answer to that is no. I think anything we can do to move uh, the cost of getting around $1.50 in the direction of being more affordable and more equitable with the rest of the region is a step that I would take forward, but clearly, and my public comments have been utterly consistent since the first day I announced this with the Premier, and even since she told me that it was coming, that it's a good first step, but only a first step, and that we have a considerable distance to go uh, in terms of this kind of integration that uh, we're all seeking. I've noted the fact uh, that it is a complex negotiation. I think as a result, in answer to some of the questions that were posed rhetorically and otherwise, it will take uh, some time uh, to resolve it. But I think um, there is the recognition just by the fact that discussions are taking place as to the importance this has not just to equity and fairness within the region, but it is a fundamentally important social and economic uh, issue. Uh, from the standpoint of social justice for people who have to get around to access opportunity and economic development because uh, people, even like Amazon, what are the questions they put into their RFP? Well, they want to know what your arrangements are for public transportation in the region. They want to know how close it is to the airport and all this kind of thing because transportation is a fundamentally important part of their being able to attract the kind of talent uh, that they need. And I just hope, again, and I spoke to this this morning at an infrastructure conference I spoke to, that I was very happy the federal government, by basing our phase one transit funding on ridership, had finally, from between and among the different governments, recognized that Toronto is different and that Toronto is very important and that we are the only municipality that has 1.7 million transit riders per day. And I would hope in the same context, by analogy, that in these discussions that are ongoing now, not that we're more important or that we're special, we're just different. And that when the arrangements are made, that it takes account of the fact that different should not mean that the people of this city are treated in any way inequitably uh, or are in any way less entitled to a seamless uh, regional fair structure that allows them to get around affordably uh, and in a consistent way both within the city and a consistent way uh, within the region. And so there's much more to be done, but I think this is a solid step forward and that is why I'm happy uh, to obviously stand here and endorse the recommendation from the Executive Committee and also to indicate as a clear signal that uh, to, to the city through the city manager to the negotiations uh, what our end objective is through Councillor Layton's motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Okay, a motion, motion number one by Councillor Layton. Do we want a court of vote? No? All in favor? Recorded.
Councillor Prutza, please. Councillor Lee. Councillor Fagadakis, please. Councillor Carmichael Greb. Councillor Campbell, please. The amendment carries unanimously, 39 in favor. Okay, on motion number two, Councillor Davis. On favor? Recorded. Councillor Kelly, Councillor Karagiannis, please. Councillor Perutza. Councillor McMahon and Councillor Wong Tam, please. The amendment carries 38 to 1. Item is amended. On favor, carried. Recorded. I know, like, you're supposed to say it before. I'm just trying to move it along. Recorded vote. Councillor Burnside, please. Councillor Prutza and Councillor DiGiorgio. Councillor Wong Tam. Councillor Shiner and Councillor Lee, please. Item is amended, carries unanimously 40 in favor. So now we'll go to our next, um, the next uh, key item, Mayor's key item, which is public works. Public works on page eight. PW 24.9, the Bloor Street West bike lane pilot project. Um, do we have any questions? Okay. Councillor Layton, questions? Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is to our transportation staff. To the extent uh, that we studied and measured this project, is it safe to say that this is the most extensively measured and evaluated transportation project we've done in the city? Through you, Madam Speaker, uh, it is safe to say that there was extensive monitoring and data collection for this study. And how did we arrive at the, dis at the, the design of the pilot project? Through you, Madam Speaker, uh, the pilot project came out of the 10-year cycling plan as well as some additional design uh, work that happened in order to uh, install it. And we worked very closely with the BIAs, the business community, uh, the adjacent communities uh, through a series of public consultations to come up with the design that we ultimately implemented through the term of the one-year pilot. So how did we work with the businesses? Um, there were a number of tactics that were used to work with the businesses. Uh, I'm going to actually let Jacqueline talk a little bit about the specifics, including door-to-door -door surveys and then a number of other uh, significant pieces. Businesses were engaged through the design process in the proposal for the pilot, as well as during the evaluation. We met with the BIAs on several occasions, and businesses were invited through door-to-door -door, um, work, as well as through, um, through letter mail to contact us with any concerns, and we met on site with businesses who had concerns. We hosted a workshop with the BIAs uh, on the prior to the design when we were still evaluating what different designs were available. Through you, Chair, that's correct. There was a workshop in advance of the, of the um, of council approval of the bike lanes in order to, to provide some input from the businesses about the design considerations. Now, if I remember correctly, there were four, four designs initially that came out of the preliminary work, correct? 
through the chair, that is correct. We looked at options that involved removal of all parking, which was ruled out for various reasons, as well as options for having parking on one side or having a, um, a bike lane that's a more standard configuration. So we didn't bring one design configuration forward, we brought four. Through the chair, absolutely, that's correct. We, we evaluated various design considerations before bringing the pilot proposal. And consultation continued during the pilot, correct? Through the chair, yes, consultation was extensive. We had, um, we had a post-installation survey, which had 14,000 respondents, which involved uh, more respondents for any transportation survey than we've ever had before. We also had a public meeting in June to report back about the survey results from that, as well as ongoing consultation with the local businesses um, as, as uh, concerns arose so we could address them. We hosted uh, workshops during the pilot and made changes as a result. Through the chair, that's right. We met with all of the local residents associations as well as the local BIAs to seek their feedback and make, um, make tweaks and modifications to the pilot to address their concerns. And those changes were, were made during the pilot? Through the chair, that's correct. One example of that would be the addition of loading zones to address concerns with loading. So what did we measure as a part of the pilot before the pilot was installed and during the pilot? Through the chair, there was an extensive uh, measurement methodology that was undertaken for this project, was, which, which was outlined to Council in a supplementary report when it was first approved. That involved measuring the effect on the cycling environment, the effect on the motoring environment, effect on curbside demands and parking, effect on local business, as well as level of support and public perception from residents and businesses. So there are metrics for each of those categories. So we, we measured traffic not only on Bloor, but on adjacent streets, both vehicle both the number of vehicles, their movement time, as well as bikes. For both the effect on the cycling environment and the effect on the motoring environment, the metrics included not only looking at Bloor, but also looking at the parallel um, corridors of DuPont and Harvard to look at the volumes and travel time of cyclists, um, and excuse me, the volumes of cyclists and the travel time and volumes of motorists. So respecting the economic impact, have we ever done a study as a city with in such detail where we've documented through survey and through uh, data like Moneris have, to document the, the, the financial impacts of a study? Through the chair, not to my awareness, um, in May of, 20, of 16, Council directed Transportation Services to undertake an economic impact study in partnership with Economic Development and Culture as well as the local BIAs. So we undertook that work as well as undertaking, um, obtaining uh, point of sale data from Moneris. Thank you, and very quickly to Michael Williams. On page 78 of our report to attract Amazon to the City of Toronto is highlights the Bloor bike lane as a reason for Amazon to come to the city. Why would you include this in that? It was clear from the uh, Amazon RFP that uh, they, were cons they were focused on uh, the uh, local culture and the participation and the pedestrian bike orientation that uh, our uh, general manager of transportation could talk more about that they're used to in Seattle and uh, they wanted to make sure that that kind of uh, uh, culture existed in the places that they were looking at. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam. Thank you questions. Very, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, so in the first year of the pilot project there was an increase of 56 percent riders, that's correct? Through you, Madam Speaker, yes. Uh, prior to the pilot, there were 3,300 cyclists on Bloor, and uh, the last count was 4,900. And are any of these, were any of these new cyclists? Yes, approximately 25%. And uh, where would you put Bloor Street's uh, usage of, uh, of these lanes compared to other lanes in the city? Bloor Street is uh, at the second highest usage now of cyclists in the city. And uh, would you describe the overall impact on vehicular travel uh, as measured throughout this project? How would you describe that? Um, the, the travel time, vehicular travel time on Bloor Street has gone up slightly. It's about two minutes increased in the eastbound direction and four minutes in the westbound direction, which is significantly reduced from uh, our initial uh, data collection uh, through some initiatives and efforts that we took to try to get that uh, back in line. And then, so what were the impacts on the adjacent corridors then, with both uh, vehicular uh, use as well as cycling? About uh, plus, or, plus or minus uh, less than a minute on Harvard and DuPont for travel times. So really, for, for a minute plus or minus, you're really not seeing any ma major measurable uh, increase. Uh, that's correct? That's correct. 
and so that's not for cars uh, and certainly for uh, for cyclists being diverted onto uh, Bloor from Harvard. Uh, Harvard was already very uh, well used and at capacity so now overall in your opinion is working. She's finished though. Through you, yes. We, we believe that the pilot has shown successfully that Bloor, uh, with a protected uh, cycling facility, can uh, attract and sustain uh, safe ridership. So travel time impacts are about 50% less. Uh, the number of cyclists using Bloor has almost doubled during the pilot project. Uh, and, uh, and all of this with no measurable impacts uh, along the adjacent corridors. That's correct. And so can you, can, let's talk about the expansion of, uh, of the program for a bit. Um, in, your, uh, in the detailed report in terms of the next steps, uh, there, there's some language about expansion. Expansion to the west. What's the timeline for the next steps uh, moving the lanes uh, westbound? Through the speaker, um, the expansion to the west would be considered as part of an overall major corridor study of the, the Bloor DuPont corridors, which council has directed staff to initiate. This pilot is the first effort in that regard, and following um, the um, council direction about the future of this pilot, we would undertake to put the expansion of the West into our work program uh, in, in 2019 or beyond. Okay, and then can you describe to me the expansion plans for going eastward? Sure, Councillor. As you're aware, the, the Bloor East section where there's a gap between Church and Sherburn, that is already under underway in terms of design and options for consideration of expansion of bike lanes further east. Um, we've had two public meetings on that project and it is in the capital program for 2019. And so both of them are, are uh, included for 2019 expansion, so that's physical built out. That's what you're planning. In the case of the capital project for Bloor East, the, it, it is in the plan for 2019, subject to council approval of that expansion. Um, consideration of further west would, under, would involve further study to be undertaken in 2019. Because we've, uh, in, in, in the two meetings that we held in the local community going westbound, um, there was no opposition from the, from the local community when you came out uh, and your team and consultants came out to talk about the, uh, the, the extension of the Bloor East bike lanes. The extension of the Bloor East bike lanes um, has received quite a bit of support from the local community, that's correct. And so is there any way possible, because we have asked this question on several occasions, but I thought I'd take the opportunity to ask this again, is there any way possible for us to expand, uh, sorry, to accelerate uh, the expansion of these bike lanes um, for the expansion uh, going east or west, and, and in particular east? Through the speaker, no. The Bloor East project is in the capital program for 2019, and that's coordinated with major water main work and streetscaping and resurfacing work that is scheduled for that time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Carmichael Griff, you would like to make an announcement? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to uh, welcome uh, the grade five class from Havergal College. Uh, part of them are here, the rest are coming. Um, the uh, Havergal College is in my ward and uh, they're here with their teacher, Ramey Lockington. Okay, so welcome. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Hart, questions. Thank you, Speaker. To staff, I understand initially you had some concerns that uh, some local businesses were expressing concerns around the impact uh, that the bike lanes would have on their business and that you engaged Moneris. Can you tell me why you selected Moneris and what you found out of that study? Through you, Madam Speaker, uh, well, in addition to the study that the BIA's commissioned through the TCAT, uh, we believe that uh, since that was largely based on survey data and a very uh, um, respectable and repeatable methodology that was used in Calgary and uh, that we were uh, working with the University of Toronto on, we believe that there was the need to have some additional point of sale data, which would have been, a very, which is a very solid sort of factual based information. Uh, about 30% of the businesses, 30% uh, of market share Moneris holds in terms of point of sale data. And so we believe that was uh, the best option. And in fact, we are also contracting with them to look at uh, impacts of small business point of sale on King Street as well. Thank you. And what did you find out of that? Um, I'm going to let you answer that because you probably have through the speaker, we found that while there was 4.45% um, growth in customer spending in the pilot area, that was higher than the control areas um, around the Danforth and in the area surrounding the pilot, which had 2.21% um, and 3.73% respectively, um, and slightly lower than the overall citywide growth of 496 But generally in the ballpark of we're seeing growth in all areas of the city with um, the most citywide, slightly less in the pilot area and less further in the control areas. 
Have you used Moneris on other projects, and will you be using them in the future? Through the speaker, we have not used Moneris data to evaluate transportation projects in the past, but we are planning to use Moneris data to evaluate the King Street pilot. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, to the uh, transportation staff, would you, um, would you say that, uh, agree that the, gr the, the overall growth in cycling ridership between DuPont, Bloor, and Harbour with the institution of the Bloor bike lanes was very modest? And in fact, a couple, the, the, other two, the other two alternative routes showed a decline. Through the speaker, we did see decline um, of 11% of cyclists on DuPont and about 25% of cyclists on Harvard Street from the before the after, although Harvard still does remain within the top 10 of um, the cycling facilities in the city. Within one year, to see the amount of growth that we saw on Bloor Street, we, we think that is, is quite substantial. Okay, but the overall, if you look at the three, the three different routes, if you look at the three different routes, what was the overall change in cycling ridership? The overall change saw an increased number of new cyclists of about 370, um, which went in the scale of, of all three routes did represent about a 3% increase. 3% increase, 3% overall, okay. Um, and I know that Harvard gets quite busy. Harvard, Harvard was a very, very busy, almost a, an overcrowded route uh, previous to Bloor coming on. Is that safe to say? Through the speaker, yes, we had um, about 4,600 cyclists using Harvard before the pilot project began, so it, it did get quite congested with cyclists in, in peak hours. So w w talk about, because I, I, don't, I don't have the report in front of me, but I, I did read it, I, but did it, did it show comparables between different months? I don't think that it did, between, for example, January, February, and June, July, in terms of ridership numbers? Through the speaker, we had before data collection in June, one year later after collection in June of 2017, and we also included um, data collection in October of 2016, six weeks after the pilot was installed. We, we, but we've never done any January, February data collection? Through the speaker, not on this, um, on, not on this pilot section. We did not collect data through the winter. Um, because of the types of technologies that collect winter cycling data, um, it wasn't uh, entirely possible to do that through the pilot project. We do have other locations in the city where year-round cycling data is collected. When this project was agreed to, and I was one of the ones that voted in favor of it, Councillor uh, Min and Wong, Deputy Mayor Min and Wong, moved a motion that passed the council asking for staff to Come, am I, you're, you're shaking your head like I'm not correct. Maybe I'm not correct. Uh, through the speaker, the, the direction from council was not, did not include having counts taken place in winter. There was recent direction from PWIC if this were to be approved to include winter cycling counts going forward. Oh, I, I, thought, that, I thought that the motion that was... I moved it at PWIC. Oh, okay. I thought this was from, from before. Okay, so I stand corrected. Um, is there... Is, is, so the, the bike lanes on... on DuPont, which, it, which reduced a, a very important lane of traffic coming into the city, those bike lanes are very underutilized. At what point would the city reassess the need for those bike lines, bike lanes? Uh, through the speaker, we, we still have close to 900 cyclists daily using that route. So uh, in the, so, in sure the peak that period, that, that's for the full day. Right. 900 compared to what on Bloor? Bloor Street is absolutely a high volume route where um, at that time we have close to 5,000. 5,000, okay, so it pales by comparison. How many city staff do we have working solely on cycling infrastructure? Through the speaker, about 15 staff work on cycling infrastructure and programs within transportation services. And, and how many city staff do we have working solely to alleviate the city of gridlock in the downtown core? Uh, through you, I, I could get back to you with the specific numbers, but uh, we have a significant crew down at Toronto East York that works on uh, clearing uh, issues. We have um, our um, maintenance teams. We have our signal teams. So it's, it's a pretty significant number. So with, with, with all due respect, I don't, I don't mean staff that just are going about the everyday business of, of adding stop signs, reducing 
you know, changing some signal timing. I mean that are really devoted toward alleviating the congestion down on Bremner and Bay and John, leading, leading down to the major transit ways of the Gardner and, and, and Lakeshore Boulevard. Do we, have a, do we have a team that is strategically devoted to that? Through you, uh, the Traffic Management Center and the Congestion Management Plan that the Traffic Management Center uses, the staff there are strategically devoted to managing congestion. They manage it through monitoring, they manage it through signal timing, they manage it through all of the component pieces that you, you would use out of that shop. Uh, and I'm not remembering the number of people who work there right now, but it's well over 100, well north of 100. Thank you. Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, through you to staff. So I, I'd like to start off with your recommendations um, and, and the costs. So the only cost attributed to this report um, is that if we remove the bike lanes. Is that correct? Through the Speaker, that's correct. But in the, in your, uh, or in the uh, recommendations passed at PWIC, um, it, it, it calls for enhancements and modifications to the bike lanes. So how much will that be costing and what modifications are you looking to do? Uh, through the speaker, those um, potential modifications have not yet been costed. We need, are subject to council approval. Design work would need to be undertaken in partnership with the local BIA who has a streetscape project in the capital program that this work could potentially be coordinated with should council approve that direction. So, and is your hope that the costs for enhancements and improvements to the bike lanes, if they are passed here, will be paid for through the BIA? No, Speaker, sorry, excuse me. Yeah. The, as part of the capital project, that would, the, the detailed design would have to identify what those costs would be, and those would be included within the Transportation so, Services budget for 2019. So we do see costs, you know, uh, more costs to this, but in the future. Through the speaker, there would be some cost synergies in doing that work as part of the overall capital project. Right. There's also uh, in, in the recommendations, I believe, um, number uh, five, to put in a burn, permanent bike counter. Um, in, in his staff recommendations that these become permanent and uh, that we do not, uh, you know, bring them out anytime soon. So why, why are we installing a permanent counter and how much would that cost? Uh, through the speaker, the recommendation from the Public Works Committee was to install a permanent bike counter to be able to understand winter cycling volumes and all year round cycling volumes. That would cost in the range of 35 to, to probably 50,000. We'd have to cost it out in terms of the location it would be installed. And the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee has recommended that in order to get more data on that facility. Right. So uh, it, it also says that vehicular volume has risen on DuPont, Bloor, and Harvard. And with that, what is the um, increase in travel time for vehicular traffic? Uh, through the speaker, the increase in travel time in the eastbound AM peak is two minutes, and the increase in travel time in the, um, the eastbound PM, sorry, east, westbound PM peak is four minutes and 15 seconds. Right. And uh, another stat that I know other members of council has questioned on this, um, but cycling use from DuPont and Harbor has significantly decreased. And is it your belief that they have moved on to Bloor? Through the speaker, we would anticipate that most of the diversion that's decreased off of DuPont and Harbor has moved on to Bloor. That's correct. So through this um, pilot project, that has been said to be one of our city's most studied transportation initiatives, the total impact is 370 new cyclists. Is that correct? Through the speaker, that's correct. correct. We counted Sorry. about 370 new trips. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, now, in terms of, I guess, the overall impact of commuting mm -hmm. on our city, uh, not just the Bloor bike lanes. Um, it has been my experience and my residents' experience that it has significantly increased, particularly to vehicular traffic. Um, would you concur with that? You have one minute. 
Through you, uh, certainly the city is growing and congestion comes along with that. I think we uh, have been taking a number of efforts in order to manage that congestion, but I think as we see growth in land use throughout the city, we're going to see growth in, in all types of traffic. I think that one of the, one of the things we're uh, most excited about with Bloor Street is that when you have people who can safely choose to cycle, then they're not driving in that same traffic that maybe many of your constituents are experiencing. Right. Um, do, you, do you know where the traffic flow is coming from on Bloor? Did you study what vehicular traffic and where are they coming from in our city? Where are they commuting from and where are the cyclists commuting from? Uh, through the speaker, there wasn't origin destination data done for this project. Um, what we do know, um, based on the, the increased travel time on Bloor Street, is that we've been, been able to mitigate that quite a bit and bring it down by half from what was initially found um, through changes to traffic signal timing and other modifications. If this were to be a made permanent, we could decrease that even further. Okay, that was your last question. Thank you, Madam Thank Speaker. You. <clears throat> Councillor Pasternak. Councillor Pasternak. <sighs> Councillor Robinson. I'm sorry, Madam. I'm not, uh, uh, Chair, I'm not ready, so. Well, we're asking questions now. <laughs> Councillor DiGiorgio. <laughs> 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 I just, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I have a couple of quick questions. First of all, uh, there's this uh, note here that says that the, when the uh, bike lanes were first installed, notwithstanding that there are temporary barriers put in place, that the uh, travel times for motorists increased. And then after a while, the actual increases in travel time for the motorists were reduced by a half. Is that correct? Through you, that is correct. But we don't know what the actual increase in travel times were on average? The, through you, the, the initial data collection that we did indicated that there was um, eight minutes in the <coughs> westbound. Sorry. There was um, an eight minute delay in the westbound, uh, westbound direction and a four minute delay in the uh, eastbound direction. Uh, and that was um, about six weeks after the pilot had gone in. And what we find when we put in uh, new installations is that it takes a little while for those to sort of uh, sort themselves out and for traffic to kind of find its pattern. And so uh, that is why after we got that information and in June, we ended up making some modifications to signal timing and other components to bring those down and we were able to cut them that, in half. That reduction is not attributed in any way to an actual reduction of, uh, of flow of traffic, that is to say the volume of uh, motorists that would be using the road? Not necessarily. There might have been some that moved off to different to different corridors. Okay, but, but I'm saying the data has not been really reviewed comprehensively. That's one comment that I would make. Secondly, my second question is, so you've introduced temporary barriers and do cyclists traveling in a cycle lane have the opportunity to weave in and out of their cycle lane by virtue of the nature of the barriers that are in place? Do they have the opportunity to enter into traffic, for example? No, through you, the, the purpose of having that protected uh, cycling facility is that they stay within that corridor and they're very predictably located next to the I curb. I understand that. What I'm saying is, mm. if they're not solid barriers, do they have the flexibility to move, weave in and out? Yes. Uh, through the speaker, it depends on which location of the cycle track. In this case, some of the protection, the barrier between the cycle track and the motor vehicles is actually parked cars. So the ability to move in and out of there um, is limited to at intersections or places where it isn't a parked car as the barrier. All right. And then my last question relates to, there is this, um, well, this sort of acceptance of a fact that any time there is an accident where it involves a motorist and a, and a cyclist, invariably the... Uh, the burden falls on the motorists simply because they're operating a larger vehicle. And my question is, going forward, will, will we give some consideration to licensing of motorists, uh, sorry, of cyclists, and making sure that cyclists carry some insurance? Um, through the speaker, staff have reported on this issue several times in the past. And they've said, no, I understand that. To, uh, I, all I'm saying that. is that if we have an increasing number of cyclists on the road, 
and we end up, just for the sake of argument, end up suffering some additional traffic accidents, will we be, will we be receptive to considering that going forward? Through the speaker, the police have indicated that they have the tools necessary to charge cyclists under the Highway Traffic Act, that licensing isn't required in order to make charges against them in the I understand that. Et the police can say that they were able to charge a cyclist, but a cyclist doesn't carry any insurance, so what's the effect of the charge? Through the speaker, most cyclists do have car insurance as well, and so their car insurance would be um, implicated cyclists, in that collision. Cyclists have car insurance? Most cyclists most are also cyclists drivers, and so yeah, but, but they tend can't, to carry you both. You Project you de okay, that's fine. So Please. you're saying the insurance policy covers them for the, for the, uh, the time when they're using a, a, cycle, uh, a bicycle. That's fine if that's the case. Thank you. Councillor Crisanti. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, so you mentioned earlier that businesses were engaged door-to-door. Uh, -door. Uh, could you detail how the businesses were engaged uh, or how were they were canvassed um, and um, if they were visited periodically throughout the year or was it just uh, at, in one time frame only? Through the speaker, businesses were visited both before the bike lanes were approved and installed, as well as after. Um, notices went out on, on multiple occasions for, to invite businesses to um, answer a survey or to contact staff with any localized issues, and staff went door to door requesting to speak with an owner or manager um, in order to address their concerns. Okay, so, uh, so, so that was before and after? Yes, that's How correct. Okay, and what were some of the major concerns that were brought up by the business owners? specifically during that canvas after? Through the speaker, concerns were brought up about the extent of the on-street parking loss and the, the lack of convenience for their customers. One of the things that we did was we worked with the Toronto Parking Authority to provide a, um, a map to provide, look, um, to provide more guidance to customers about getting to those off-street lots as well as a coupon code so that customers could use a coupon of $4 at that parking transaction um, in the TPA lot. We also heard concerns about loading um, and worked with the businesses to address whether the laneways adjacent to their business would be appropriate for loading, and we introduced new loading areas um, on intersecting streets to address their concerns as well. Okay, and, and what types of businesses uh, or establishments seem to be the most opposed or most impacted negatively uh, during this pilot project? You were able to identify some, I assume. Um, through the speaker, we heard some concerns from restaurants, um, but from, there were varying levels of support from type, different types of businesses or levels of concern from other types of businesses, so it would be difficult to characterize. Okay, well, so I, I visited the site three or four times, and I did some of my own canvas. So I specifically had businesses that said to me that their business volume during this pilot project decreased. One uh, individual indicated by 16%, another one indicated 25%. So these are specifics that I myself got in a very short period of time. Did you not capture any of this? Through the speaker, we did hear those type of, of um, reports from local businesses. This was one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that we looked at getting um, a third party source for that information from the Moneris um, point of sale data. Okay. And in terms of safety, um, has there been uh, any discussion with respect to maybe increased enforcement? Uh, another thing that I, I noticed when I was there, uh, the, the several times that I visited, that some cyclists, of course, and it happens all over the city, just don't obey the rules of the road, but they took the opportunity, the fact that there were bike lanes there, to just use it as a speedway, and they're just speeding down without much regard for pedestrians that might be in their way or other vehicles making a right, uh, left turn or right turn onto a street. So what is the, um, the plan for that? Through the speaker, we did hear some concerns about cycling behavior and one of the, um, the new campaigns as part of the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan will be about um, a appropriate cycling behavior. All right. Um, so we can get pretty aggressive winters, as we know. Uh, so, in terms of dealing, well, a couple of things. In terms, let's start with the garbage pickup. I assume there's some form of garbage pickup along Brewer Street as there is in any major road. 
Uh, so now we have the bike lanes and we got, uh, we've got it down to two lanes. How, how is that going to be managed in the process? Through the speaker, it's managed quite similarly to how it was before the cycle tracks were in place, where there was on-street parking taking that space curbside. So the garbage trucks um, were cons solid waste was was consulted as part of our process of design, and garbage trucks operate beside the cycle track. In some cases, they enter the cycle track to collect garbage curbside. That seems to it has operated quite well in the past winter. Would this happen dur during the day, any time during the day, or or later on when there's less traffic, maybe or or overnight, possibly? Uh, through the speaker, some of the, the garbage collection um, is municipal, and that generally on Bloor Street happens in the overnight period, um, where, where there's private collection, then they would have to determine that based on their business needs. So if it's an overnight pickup there, I, I would suspect someone working overnight could get paid more from someone working during the day. So it could add to cost, possibly? Through the speaker, I wouldn't be able to comment on the, on the cost of the solid waste um, division on that, but they did operate overnight prior to the bike lanes as well. Okay, that was your last question. That was your last question, sorry. Recess to two o'clock.